colleagues and friends. Uh, really, it's a big honor for me to open our international conference, ALTA 2018, ALTA, Advanced Learning Technologies. Each year we have this conference and each year we have a little bit difficult, uh, different topics. Last year it was dedicated conference to MOOCs and uh, for more close collaboration between educational sector and business sector. In this year, really, we have new uh, highlight the thematics. It is leadership in higher education. And in this uh, conference, we have special session dedicated to National Digital Co Coalition. Really, I am happy about that. And as I mentioned, all plenary session uh, speakers will have possibility to present ideas not to audience encounters in our conference room but to all internet users because we will broadcasting all speeches second you will have possibility to see a record of these presentations as you see each uh, plenary session speaker have about 20 minutes minutes <coughs> more or less and later as i mentioned we will divide it, our conference participants into part english speaking session and in, uh, it will be session when we speak in the session in Lithuanian language. Uh, now it's really a big honor for me to invite <coughs> our first speaker, Professor Robertas Damasiavičius from Kaunas University of Technology, not to tell welcome but to present our university, KTU, and maybe what we are doing, we will do in Horizon 2020. Please, floor is yours. I'm very delighted to welcome all guests uh, to this uh, very important conference, both for university and also for Lithuania as well. And uh, this conference uh, brings uh, together all most important people in educational technologies in Lithuania from Lithuania as well as uh, from uh, more wider region and. Uh, Yet, uh, Dangole said that uh, the main topic is uh, leadership in education. This conference, yeah? But uh, as I read uh, the conference program, I noticed another topic, is, uh, which is smart technology applications in education, which is very close uh, to me as I'm from the IT background. And this topic resonates uh, very strongly with Lithuania's National Smart Specialization uh, strategy, strategy 2030, which is uh, Lithuania is a smart uh, country, a good place to live and work. So uh, the strategic goal of this uh, strategy is to develop uh, uh, innovation and technologies uh, to develop uh, capacities uh, to address local and global challenges, uh, also uh, to increase the competitiveness of Lithuania's research institutions. And uh, Kaunas University of Technology as an university addressed uh, these uh, challenges by uh, performing uh, a number of uh, structural uh, reforms aiming to increase the competitiveness of the university in uh, uh, local as well as in a global uh, research and study market. So, uh, I don't know <coughs> how much you know about uh, our university, it's mainly technological university. Uh, we have faculties such as uh, Faculty of Chemical Technology, also Faculty of Electrical and Electronics Engineering and Faculty of Informatics. Also there are some other humanitarian and social sciences. And uh, uh, in recent uh, years uh, we aim to reduce the over-fragmentation of uh, our research and study units. These units uh, were too small to compete uh, on a global market. As a result uh, of these reforms, uh, the number of faculties uh, were reduced uh, from, uh, from a number of 14 to current number of 9 by uh, joining uh, related faculties, related departments, related research groups and uh, 
this uh, allowed us to strengthen our research uh, capacities. And also uh, another major achievement in recent years was uh, the opening of the uh, Santa Car Valley, uh, which uh, I hope you visited in uh, some previous day. And uh, uh, this ability to concentrate uh, our infrastructure, our people in one uh, place, in one location, uh, gives us more opportunities to, to reach for, for higher goals. With, uh, some of the facts about our university, uh, currently we have about 11,000 students, uh, 1,000 academic staff, and uh, uh, each year about 3,000 uh, students graduate from our university, and uh, these numbers uh, puts uh, us uh, as the leading technological university in Lithuania and one of the leaders in the Baltic states. And uh, uh, our efforts, our achievements uh, uh, were evaluated at the recent university multi-rank uh, ranking, uh, which uh, evaluated more than 1,000 uh, universities from more than 80 countries and uh, uh, I am glad uh, to announce you that uh, KTU was ranked among uh, top 8% universities in the world <laughs> and then uh, uh, specific categories were considered uh, uh, KTU scored number one assessments in a number of uh, uh, categories such as uh, the number of interdisciplinary publications as well as uh, international undergraduate and master programs. And uh, here are some of our achievements which uh, allowed us to, to achieve uh, this high <coughs> scores, uh, which is the number of uh, winning uh, uh, FP7 projects with uh, small and medium sized enterprises as well as uh, uh, the amount of research and development performed uh, uh, for Lithuanian business and industry, uh, as well as uh, the amount and quality of uh, publications published by KTU researchers. As I uh, said, uh, Lithuania has formulated its national smart specialization uh, topics and university responded to these topics by formulating its own strategic priority research topics and uh, one uh, of the topics uh, which is uh, performed by faculty of informatics is uh, smart environments and information technology which uh, is uh, a topic uh, uh, which is very relevant uh, for, for uh, research uh, both at the national level and both at the European level. So here are some statistics which I would not comment uh, and uh, maybe I would like to share with some of our success uh, stories. Uh, we already have a number of projects approved by uh, Horizon 2020 program uh, and uh, one of the projects uh, approved was um, together with a number of uh, European and uh, European universities and also uh, industrial partners which uh, addresses the problem of developing uh, uh, organic uh, LEDs, efficient organic uh, LEDs. Uh, and uh, another project also Approved, which I do not see. For some reason, it's empty. It's uh, a teaming project which aims uh, the development of uh, the Center of Excellence in Science and Technology for Healthy Aging, and it uh, brings together uh, <coughs> Lithuanian. Uh, Three Lithuanian universities, it's uh, KTU, also Lithuanian University of Health Sciences and Vilnius University, and also universities from Sweden and Finland. And uh, this uh, proposal uh, 
was one of the 31 retained for funding and uh, the number of submission, submitted proposals was 169, which shows that uh, we had really a large competition in, which, in this field. So basically, uh, what, uh, when we analyze the success story, what, uh, what we are the reason for, for successful uh, uh, proposal, so uh, first of all, it's internationalization. We must find and team up with the best uh, players in uh, uh, some specific field. Also, we must uh, specialize. So we have to find uh, a niche of uh, expertise uh, where we can be European level leaders. And also, infrastructure is very impo important. So, we have invested very much in developing our research space and also <coughs> in uh, attracting the best people uh, uh, in Lithuania. So, uh, currently, what's ahead? Uh, in uh, Horizon 2020, currently, uh, a work program for the next two years is discussed. And uh, here I want to share some of the uh, uh, elements of this uh, program. It's currently only a draft version and the uh, uh, final version uh, should be approved and uh, made public in July. And uh, there is a draft uh, budget of this two-year program and I don't know if you see uh, the largest part of this budget is dedicated to content technologies the largest uh, amount of funding and uh, uh, of the uh, calls uh, which are under this topic I would like to bring attention to calls ICT 22 technologies for learning and skills and ICT 24 <coughs> gaming and gamification which uh, uh, have uh, many commonalities with the topic of this uh, conference uh, and uh, so in ICT 22, Technologies for Learning and Skills, uh, the specific challenge is to uh, create an innovation ecosystem that will facilitate more open, more effective, more efficient co-design, co-creation and use of digital content tools and services for personalized learning and teaching. And uh, what uh, 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 tools, what infrastructure is uh, expected to be developed? So uh, uh, this uh, call calls for development of open interop interoperable components uh, for flexible, scalable and cost-effective cloud-based digital learning infrastructure to deliver new solutions and educational services for personalized, collaborative or experimental learning. And uh, the proposed solutions should cover one of the following areas. It's uh, a creation of uh, context services or applications for interactive learning processes. Also, environments for new learning experience and experimentation which include uh, new multimedia technologies such as uh, 3D simulation, uh, uh, visualization, augmented and virtual reality and also adaptive and multimodal technologies and also educational support services. In research and innovation actions, uh, uh, the call emphasizes uh, the development of uh, services for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics combined with arts team. So that uh, innovation and creative capacities of learners could be improved. And uh, also it calls for the uh, introduction and development of new enabling technologies such as effective computing, also mixed reality learning environments, 
we have variable technology and others. <coughs> and the expected impact of uh, such uh, projects should be more efficient and effective learning uh, through the new, new digital technologies and also more efficient ways of uh, assessing learning outcomes. And also, uh, uh, another expected impact is the development and uh, making available new open cloud-based computer components, tools, and services for use in digital learning scenarios. Another goal which uh, also very strongly emphasizes uh, uh, applications in education, in learning, it's gaming and gamification. It's uh, a growing industry of application which focuses on serious games. That is, uh, uh, games uh, which uh, uh, have serious, aim and serious aims and uh, uh, are focusing uh, on engaging people to perform some serious actions. Uh, so, uh, this call uh, uh, specifically emphasizes uh, the development of uh, gaming and gamification uh, applications uh, in uh, education, training and health. And uh, uh, what uh, is expected from uh, these activities is uh, that uh, uh, there will be projects uh, which will focus on gaming technologies uh, which include uh, uh, also augmented <coughs> mixed reality, uh, virtual reality, interactive storytelling, uh, narratives, uh, uh, and it will include learning and behavioral triggers such as uh, assessing pedagogical effectiveness, engagement, creativity, collaborative behaviors, and other social aspects. So the expected impact is uh, the increased uh, uh, use of uh, gaming technologies in a serious context, specifically in education. So these two calls are planned for the next year and uh, I think that uh, uh, there will be interest from the participants of this conference also to, to submit proposals uh, to this uh, ICT post. And also I would like uh, to use this uh, opportunity to advertise uh, another conference which is also organized by ITU. It is the 21st International <coughs> Conference on Information and Software Technologies. Uh, it will take place uh, uh, in Druskink and beautiful resource, uh, resort town uh, uh, in Lithuania. And uh, uh, we will have a special session on e-learning technologies and systems. And uh, the call is still open. It will close on May 19. So I will uh, uh, encourage you to submit papers to this conference. Uh, and. Uh, <coughs> Uh, it will be another opportunity to meet uh, uh, our colleagues uh, and our partners from, from other institutions. So with that, I would like to thank you all. I, I was so happy to see that sometimes we are telling to be in the right place and in the right time. I think a lot of us we are participating in the projects. And now we see that really a lot of money, a lot of activities are waiting for us. And, it, and we get in our hands, we will be active or not, and maybe really we will be successfully in our application and maybe together, because one of the reasons for this conference, not only to listen to some presentations, but to begin as a friends, especially with our friends from UK, Estonia, Ireland, and Ukraine. Please use this time. And thank you, Robertus. If you could have some questions, I hope we, Robertus will stay until the coffee break. And anyway, I really would like to invite, especially Ukrainians, to participate in October in Lusinian Kai. And our guest, fantastic place, fantastic spa. <laughs> and <laughs> proceedings will be really very, very high level, springle level. 
our proceedings or it is concurrent because index uh, uh, level we have enough for our proceedings. But really it's first time, maybe next time in Ukraine we have possibility to publish our papers in so high level proceedings. Really I invite you very much and I'm supporting this conference because I am chairman of this session. Since really I'm so happy and I would like to thank the professor for really presenting uh, really, I think it is a very, very nice presentation. Okay, thank you. Maybe I will not use this. <laughs> Usually we have some presents, but I'm so sorry, Robertas. This is logo with KTU, but Robertas, I think, he have some. Uh, this, uh, how to say, some souvenirs, and maybe I will keep the souvenir to our foreign guest. It's okay? Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and now, uh, our next speaker, we have a, a guest from Ministry of Education, Vaino Prasdekis, and I would like to ask Vaino present a really generous, strategic view, what we are doing in Lithuania, and of course, we are not separate country, but how looks education in the future, and maybe some ele elements from the past. Vaino, floor is yours. morning it's, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, of course uh, as uh, guest I'm from ministry I, I don't know how to say I need to, to take uh, some congratulations for conference because I think it's quite quite interesting conference and uh, it's annual I think conference and uh, each year it's some people coming here and uh, maybe from Vilnius I am just maybe first time I don't know Tangola knows more but anyway I will try to 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 to, to say not only uh, some uh, congratulations for conference, but I will try to say some some more details about uh, uh, actions from central level. What are, are doing on technology? Because this conference on advanced technology, so I I think it's uh, it's uh, uh, two options. It's one option that uh, universities, high institutions, are doing a lot uh, on technology. But on the other hand, it's uh, uh, national level what. Uh, and national level as well. It's not uh, passive now. It's uh, it's some activities are uh, going as as well. But just for history, it's uh, so, so I try to find some logo. Uh, 2001, 2006. It was uh, it means later we uh, we are uh, we was uh, involved in some Lithuanian virtual university program. And now we have some like logo, new logo, and it's not so so new, but it's a logo, which means we have now litmus program on, on central level. <coughs> just if uh, uh, to, to see uh, in uh, this logo, just it's quite old now, I think it's five years, something, something like that. And maybe it's from Dangora slide, I, I, I'm not sure, but uh, I, I, I found in some, some slides in. Uh, some uh, Google uh, searching, <laughs> but uh, to other hand, it, it, it was ma it we uh, in 2007 we made a big investment in in three pillars like distance learning, uh, libraries, and uh, uh, information system for uh, science and studies, and three pillars was some like integrate with. Uh, uh, one of uh, uh, important, I think, uh, e-learning element, but it was element uh, not so, so how to say, uh, uh, popular, and uh, uh, it's not so many uh, investment was made on, on that, and more more investment was made in, in three uh, other pillars. Uh, from uh, new program uh, idea uh, about new program from 2013, it's. Uh, a main uh, um, investment to some information system and try to integrate the system uh, I, 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 in one uh, some like effective way and of course uh, to, to, to provide this system in 
uh, in effective way. If you like uh, look in pillars of the system, it still exists in uh, electronic library, uh, some like uh, uh, e-document collections, and uh, just it's uh, now uh, we have six main collections: thesis, journals, books, proceedings. Uh, it's uh, a study system or the advanced uh, systems, to, and it's some uh, central service, and it's. Uh, uh, from Kaunas main university, it's a Moodle system, uh, it's video lecturing system, and I think this system are using now for, for our recording. It's some uh, uh, video conference solution, video, uh, and open course system, it's quite new, I think. Uh, but it was, it's uh, as uh, some LEADM system. We have now new name, uh, Edina, it's uh, from uh, LEMSIS, old version, it's a system for management of information system, it's some cloud service for uh, all high institutions, and it's more for administration, uh, uh, financial, human studies process, and uh, uh, from uh, uh, central point, from ministry point, we as well uh, made education management information system, which is uh, mainly served for, for Ministries, but of course we as well made some student and teacher registers, and it's still now quite important for us and working well. Uh, just uh, what is MS? Uh, just maybe it's quite big uh, uh, system. Uh, we used all data from all systems, and uh, this data are now open and, and could be used from different users, some like student. Some like from uh, all uh, uh, some web page is some for research or for some uh, registry user. Just uh, some maybe pay, uh, what we integrated like if you look uh, from which general school are now mainly student uh, uh, taking uh, to medical studies and if I won't be a medical student, I, I need to pu to be maybe more. Uh, 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 gymnasium from Kaunas technology or gymnasium from Yazoo gymnasium, it's possible more be uh, 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 some student, uh, student uh, 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 if I want to be. And this data, it's, it's very now easy to put in, in one big data. Or our ideas, if I want to look at how technology studies are going now well, and I, I could see how many students are now on technology each year uh, and to, uh, to look uh, uh, wh wh how it's, it's going. So integration of data uh, from all systems is quite, quite important. I think. If you look o on w uh, what was uh, uh, made uh, in last three years, we, we, uh, uh, we super from ministry level, was support for few uh, projects like uh, uh, for uh, LAMBA, uh, it's for e-document, uh, e <coughs> for LEADM, and from LEMSIS. Of course, main, mainly are going for money for, for LEMSIS, and for, for MS it was uh, some allocate money, and uh, very important annual money for, for general expenses, and uh, plus it's approximately 10 to 20 percent from uh, uh, consortiums, consortium from uh, institution, I mean uh, university consortiums. Where now it's very important as well, some money going not only from ministry, but of course uh, going from, from consortium. And it, 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 this project was, uh, uh, I think it's finished, maybe Lemsis is still open till something, f uh, summer time, but it uh, it's, uh, 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 was made. And, and for next three, five, or s I, I don't know, three, five to 2020 something, are planning as well a few projects, but ma ma main project will be for uh, electronic libraries and the study administration systems. Uh, uh, some uh, some system will still will be support for e-study, and, and some <coughs> will be annual, uh, and we will need some money from, uh, of course, uh, consortium. Uh, of course, will be some tenders. It's not only planning process. For, for tenders, it's uh, planning, but we'll have a lot uh, is names in Lithuanian uh, ideas, uh, and we'll support uh, uh, 
uh, special tools, uh, special some like uh, environment for studies, uh, and, and it po will be possible from our school, fr from not only for uh, some planned process. Uh, just if uh, it's not only uh, uh, these pillars are going. Uh, in higher education, we have as well some LitNet, computer network of research studies education institutions. It's, it's uh, working uh, for all universities, and LitNet now, I think, as well is here. Uh, we have LAMA before, joint admission system for each uh, uh, university. So, so systems is, is quite well, and if you look on some uh, old systems and how uh, how universities are using, we, we will see that uh, uh, LAMA, MS, uh, LAMA, before LITNEX are using all. Uh, maybe uh, near them it's not all, and VMS it's, it's still not all, but uh, how, maybe it's correlated with money. Maybe if you will put so money, we will have more more schools in, in the system. But Trevor Hand, Trevor Hand uh, I think it's a lot of benefits from systems. It's unlike cloud service. It's very now modern systems. It's not, uh, how to say, uh, in old-fashioned systems. It's very important data integration. Now we, we could integrate a lot of data. Uh, and you know that in uh, commission ideas and in, in some uh, industries, it's a very important question, big data. And uh, if some, somebody wants to have uh, access to big data is possible now. It's a question, do you have time to, to look inside? It's some synergy. I think it's very important when uh, universities are working uh, <coughs> in join. It's possible to have uh, some uh, discounts. It's possible to have some like uh, knowledge hubs between each other. As well as participation, I think uh, in in last uh, time it's it's very important uh, that it's not only ministry system. It, it's a system which we are uh, using by consortiums, uh, and it's very important that not the ministry are, uh, are how to say manage everything. It's ministry is only money only some money, but ideas and etc. are going from uh, uh, institutions, from, from, uh, from schools, from higher education. So it's a lot of benefit. Of course it's some, I would say, consideration, but uh, I am not uh, here to present that. It may be for, it's for, for, my, uh, for some Vilnius maybe meeting will be. I, I will stop on benefits, okay? So thank you and, and I, I, I wish you a good conference. <laughs> good ideas, and I, 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 I am uh, maybe so, not so long, but uh, if you have questions, so I, I can answer. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Vaino, for really short, but let's continue the presentation. But really, we are waiting, really. But now I think we have chance to ask person from Ministry of Education questions, especially I'm looking to Lithuanian. Uh, to Lithuanians in this room, because now it's the place to ask why it's uh, for distance education only 1.4 million, at much more to, to the libraries, I'm joking. But really, some questions to we know. Coffee break as well for questions. Uh, da, da, da. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, I move to, to Russia. Okay, if, yeah, one minute, please, please. Can you introduce yourself and maybe in English or maybe in another language? It's, uh, mm -hmm. I would like to ask a question about, uh, uh, we are talking about uh, uh, okay. social responsibility okay. of uh, universities and uh, educational technologies are coming into the very deep uh, uh, level. Uh, so uh, how you see the situation from the point of social responsibility? It's look like we are in, in, in scientific conference, <laughs> and we did discuss about uh, uh, definitions. <coughs> but anyway, uh, it's need to analyze everything and the social responsibility. I don't know what, what, what we mean. Maybe if you mean uh, people who are on uh, out of technology, it, it, maybe we need to 
to help them, to provide. Maybe it's more important uh, to work with people who are in some some uh, problem, social problems. Not, uh, and maybe some people who are now quite well on on uh, on, on on society. Maybe we need to 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 to, to be how to say. Maybe we need to to prioritize for some technology or some people who are out or some people who are in, inside more better. I know. Maybe you, you could discuss that today. <laughs> Questions for you, not for me. More questions. Really, we have very good chance. Of course, I agree on coffee break to ask personally, but maybe some questions would be interesting for all of us. No. Okay. okay. Thank you, Vino. Okay. And one minute. <laughs> one minute. It's number is about countless University of Technology. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, now, usually when we speak about conference, we are waiting our colleagues, friends, and really, today, really, we have fantastic possibility to be together with our Ukrainian <laughs> friends. And really, I am so happy because we have common project, Tempus project, and maybe during, and I know next speaker, especially Svetlana Kalashnikova, maybe during 10 years, maybe more. And now I would like to invite Svetlana Kalashnikova from Ukraine to present presentation. And as I know, you invite more people from yeah. Ukraine to share experience from higher education, development of high, uh, development of higher education in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Please, Just Svetlana. I'm trying uh -huh. to show. Yeah. Oh, could you Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, dear Chair, dear colleagues, uh, it is really my great pleasure to start this presentation from the world Labadena. <laughs> and uh, first of all, on behalf of our big Ukrainian delegation from our team, I would like to use <laughs> this possibility to thank our Lithuanian colleagues and friends for your support, for our collaboration and for our common efforts to make educational system better and to make our countries better. And from our delegation, I would like to present you this picture <laughs> with symbols of Ukraine. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> okay. In the frame of... Uh, <coughs> how to use? Don't I need your help. Oh. I hope this is... Okay, this is more. Okay. Uh, in the frame of my presentation, I would like to inform you very shortly about our new law on higher education and about the changes, changes uh, which this law provocated in our system. Yes. Uh, the law was launched on September last year, but there are some parts of this document which will work a little later. From September this year, uh, we are waiting for new National Higher Education Quality Agency. And from January next year, uh, we'll work, uh, we, uh, now we are in development of new mechanism for electronic entrance and electronic allocations of the state budget funds among the <laughs> higher education institutions. Uh, just to explain what is real role of this law for reforms of our Ukrainian higher education system, I will use uh, some uh, remarks of key persons of our education system. Professor Mich uh, uh, Mikhail Osgrovsky, who is the rector of uh, Kyiv Polytechnical University, one of the best Ukrainian university, and who was the leader of group uh, which created this law, uh, mentioned that the law is the first legal act directed to implementation of real reforms in our society. Professor Kuit, who is the Minister of Educational and Sciences of Ukraine, mentioned that uh, thanks to this law, Ukrainian higher education has overcome post-Soviet relapses and landed 
in other reality. It's really true. And uh, Lilia Hrinevich, who is the head of our Parliament Committee on Education, underlines that the law creates background for realization of the association agreement with the European Union in the part of educational reform. Uh, the law provocates a lot of changes, it's really true, it's absolutely new philosophy of, real, uh, of function of our educational system, but I would like to underline only three main vectors. The first is changes in the structure of higher education. You see that we have some really big changes. Uh, level and degree uh, junior specialist was excluded from higher education level and removed into vocation education. Just to uh, understand value of the exchange, for current moment we have about 300 uh, uh, universities, academies of higher <coughs> education and about 800 college which work previously at level uh, specialist, junior specialist. And now it's big challenge for this institution to confirm their ability to be in higher education level. Next change uh, about specialist, degree of specialist and candidate of sciences uh, were cancelled. And for current moment, new structure of higher education level has uh, three typical levels, uh, short cycle, uh, junior bachelor and first bachelor the second master and the third level, PhD level, and also our national specifics. This is Doctor of Sciences. I can say that the most important changes we are waiting in the level PhD because it's absolutely innovation for us, uh, doctoral structural programs. Uh, the, second, uh, the second level of changes is uh, forming development and forming national uh, quality assurance system. It's uh, absolutely new philosophy and we are awaiting that this new system will be based and work on uh, the principle of independence, representativeness, professionalism, transparency uh, and publicity. Uh, for current moment uh, uh, we are planning two level um, uh, uh, plus European level of course uh, external system which will respond for two main functions licensing of educational activity and accreditation of educational program and in this direction we will have two levels at the national level national quality assurance agency on <coughs> higher education and also sub levels profiles agency who uh, will be responsible for different areas uh, uh, for educational system and as for me, uh, the biggest challenge is uh, to create internal system of quality assurance uh, it to make our university be responsible for concrete policy, quality assurance policy, procedures and monitoring process on the institutional level. And uh, the, third uh, the third vector of changes is uh, creation new model of uh, governance in higher education. At the national level, if we speak about Ministry of Education and Science of Ukraine, we mean uh, decentralization and deregulation of all process for higher education system. At the institutional level, we speak about increasing higher education institution autonomy for all four aspects, uh, academic, organizational, staff autonomy, and of course, financial autonomy. What main steps for current moment uh, are realized? Uh, I would like to underline only three aspects. For current moment, Ukraine has new official list of knowledge areas and specialities uh, developed due to international standard qualifi qualification of education. And this decree was approved of Cabinet of Ministry of Ukraine. And it also was a very big challenge for our system. A lot of debates, a lot of... Uh, discussion but for current moment we have this document to go ahead 
Uh, and also very important uh, decision is uh, and the result of current reform during these six months, just to understand the period I'm about uh, I'm speaking, uh, decree about establishment of National quality, uh, Higher <coughs> Education Quality Assurance Agency and its statute. These documents also were approved by the Cabinet Minister of Ukraine and now Ukraine is in very interesting process of election uh, of delegates to this represent new, absolutely new for us, representative bodies for quality, uh, for quality assurance of higher education. I think the very important result we have uh, for, in, uh, for the vector of internalization of higher education, but he is the head of our department of ministry uh, and Anna will have a possibility to just inform you about this result. Next steps. Uh, now uh, the ministry with the community is working on the development of strategy of higher education reform 2020. Uh, and uh, the biggest challenge for us now is uh, as the following. Uh, to develop new generation of higher education standards based on competence approach. Optimization of network of higher education institutions. Do you understand that for current moment we have more than 1,000 higher education institutions? Even for Ukraine, where uh, for uh, 43 million people, it's a very big network. Uh, also, a very important task for us is uh, to develop and to implement new mechanism of fun financing uh, for education process and for research. And also, very big challenge is integration, to provide integration between higher education institutions and research areas. Uh, uh, what we see, uh, what is the real risk to implement these reforms? Uh, I would like, uh, this is ability of our community uh, for changes our ability to go ahead and not only to speak about reform, but to be ready to change. And here I would like uh, to underline, as for me, three, uh, four uh, very important positions. Main risk and main challenge for higher education institutions to be ready to share and to take responsibility or uh, what it means uh, to be responsible for the autonomy and for the quality. It's a question, you know. It was easier to live in that system where the ministry were, uh, was responsible for everything. Uh, another aspect, very important, uh, it's another challenge is to be, to live and to provide uh, activity in transparency and publicity. We mean uh, reporting, we, uh, I mean uh, financial documents, uh, uh, information about all dissertation, about election process, etc. Um, challenge uh, for both for higher education institution and for Ministry of Education and Sciences to start to work due to new model of decision making and to provide real new communication culture to provide uh, state and community relations. And also a very big challenge, this is real <coughs> level of competence of people, of professionals to live and to work in new reality. Uh, just to finish my presentation, I would like to say that as for me, the <coughs> main risk is the trust. Unfortunately, during the previous period, the trust between different stakeholders in our, in, in our higher education system was lost. It's really true. I mean trust between the ministry and rectors. Uh, trust between the rectors and faculty. Uh, between the faculty and students. And now our main task, uh, I mean all stakeholders which are working in the system to renovate this trust and to go ahead with trust, with trust to each other. I don't see another factors for success in this, this very complicated situation. <laughs> and 
Um, I'm really happy that the, our team, uh, team of our project, uh, Tempus Project Elite Education for Leadership, Intelligent and Talent Encouraging, one of our main task is also to help our university to be leaders, uh, to be ready to take this autonomy and to be responsible for, uh, this, uh, for the quality of our activity. And uh, now it's uh, really my pleasure and my honor to invite Anna Novosad, who is head of our Department of Internalization of our Ministry of Education and Science of Ukraine, to ask Anya to inform yeah. very shortly about your results, because it's very important, I'm absolutely yeah. sure. Thanks, everyone. I will jump a little bit um, unannounced into the program. I haven't prepared any presentation, but, so I'll be very brief. Uh, I think it's very early to say about results because internationalization is a word that is not only hard to pronounce but it's also very hard to process and uh, very hard to manage. Yes, there is a law on the, um, higher education in, in Ukraine that's been introduced uh, and that's been active almost half a year, right? And it uh, stipulates internationalization as a philosophy. Uh, this um, internationalization brings a lot of challenges to the status quo because it's, uh, it has to change the way of thinking um, it has to change the uh, education model and it has to also, it greatly impacts the um, uh, mode of governance and management. And when I say the mode of governance, I, I mean not only the Ministry of Education and Science, but also higher education institutions and the Ministry of Finance. Um, right now, uh, I think it's high time for us to understand why internationalization matters for the government and why does it matter for higher education institutions. I think that. Uh, uh, why does it matter for uh, education institutions is up to them. I will talk about that with my colleagues, but um, I can say from the point of view of the government that it's it's just paramount for us because it will it help us to it will help us to integrate in the global system of education. It will help us to gain a skilled workforce with global awareness, and apart from that, it's a great source of revenue. We have to be honest about that, right? Um, I wouldn't say that uh, internationalization and inter international cooperation is something uh, very new for Ukraine. We have, uh, just for you to understand, we have around 61,000 foreign students. That's a big number. But most of them are coming from former um, uh, Commonwealth of Independence, not former, Commonwealth of Independent States countries, and also many region. This means that these students are mostly studying in Russian or Ukrainian. What is the challenge? We have to, in order to uh, enforce the fully fledged internationalization, we have to kind of uh, ask or, 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 I don't know, um, force, or you can use another thing, you know, our higher education institutions to <coughs> develop their English taught programs. Uh, what the ministry is doing right now, uh, no, I want to say briefly about another thing. I was amazed by the institutional backbone that you have in Lithuania. The previous speaker presented the uh, Center for Information Technologies, right? Yeah. This, this, is a, this is a great endeavor you have. And I wish we had that in Ukraine, and, but for that we need a strong alliance of uh, all the government institutions, uh, I guess, and, and the vision uh, how to implement that. But right now we are also working on establishment of, of a sort of upfront office like you have in Lithuania uh, Education Exchange Supports Foundation, right? We have to develop something like that in Ukraine because there has to be a steering body that manages uh, and administers all the mobility and other internationalization activities. Uh, the ministry right now is using, so to say, um, carrot and stick uh, activities in order to foster this uh, uh, internationalization, uh, internationalization on higher education institutions. <coughs> uh, we are trying to, first of all, to uh, simplify all the bureaucratic procedures. It might seem very simple and very, you know, um, not uh, fundamental, but it does matter. When the university has to agree everything with the ministry, it just doesn't work. But this is something that we, we are trying to simplify right now by introducing new uh, ways to handle mobility, uh, new ways to, I don't know, handle uh, trips, and so on and so forth. We have introduced new um, decree on diploma recognition. But of course, uh, these are just minor blocks, but we have jointly with the higher education institutions, we have to work on a fully fledged and realistic uh, internalization strategy in line with the law and in line with the broader strategy on higher education development. Apart from that, it's a great pleasure for me to say that in March we have uh, signed the Horizon 2020 Association, so now we are very proud to be an associated country. We are, hopefully we will ratify it in July and we will be also 
or almost fully fledged member of all the governance structures. So I'd like to encourage and invite all the Lithuanian uh, universities and other research institutions to cooperate um, with Ukrainians, because um, just uh, for you for for your information, in FP7, for example, in Ukraine was one of the not the one of the but the first uh, among the unassociated associated no, among the third countries who were the first in rankings by um, winning the uh, projects. So Ukrainians have experience and they are quite successful there. So I, I really looking forward to uh, see a more open, more um, I don't know, enhanced Ukrainian Swedish cooperation. I'd like to, and just another brief remark: internalization is not always about mobility, and this is the very um, uh, redundant way we see it in Ukraine. But it's also about distance learning. It's also about uh, uh, improving ICT uh, opportunities of the university. So it's a big um, thing for me to be here and to learn of uh, different ways how you handle this uh, this process. So I'm thankful for the opportunity to speak and to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, can I invite Anna and Svetlana? I think. Uh, what about questions? <laughs> And really, maybe some of you have questions to Svetlana, to Anna, because as we, all of us, especially Lithuanians, as we see, we have fantastic partners, and they can be our partners in future projects. Yeah. Some questions, please. No. I think during the coffee. Oh, during the coffee. Okay. <laughs> and now I would like to thank Anna. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Svetlana, one minute, please. And to Svetlana. And you, when you will drink tea, yes, thank you. Thank you. please remember how. Thank you. thank you. And now it's time to invite our next speaker, John from Dublin. And usually when we are uh, telling old friend, old friend, really we have long uh, story uh, to doing a lot of things, to being in different projects, I think, very long time. And John, floor is yours. And maybe... Uh -huh. Thank you, Danga. Uh -huh. uh -huh. uh, uh. I don't know which file. Egidio, could you help us with file? Because I don't know. Okay. Which way do you press it down then? Just as we yeah. said, yeah. get it into the... Yeah. Uh, hi everybody, good morning. You all appear to be very knowledgeable, no questions. <laughs> this, is, this session is going to be a bit more interactive. Oh, sorry, oh, right. sorry. 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 Is that okay? <laughs> yeah, so we, want, we want to see you smiling a bit more and uh, you know, enjoying the conference. Uh, my role in Dublin, uh, I suppose I've been a long time in education. I've been a school uh, principal and I've also worked for 20 years in the classroom. Uh, do, you, do you want to have a chat or do you want to listen to me? <laughs> because uh, I'd like to, having come from Dublin, I'd like to engage with you and to make it, you know, make it nice, make your experience a pleasant experience. Uh, and I hope that our education system in Ireland has lots of aspects that you would like and that may be helpful for you. For interest's sake, how many people here have already been to Dublin, to Ireland? Okay, so we have about four people so there's a good opportunity to increase the tourism to Ireland, isn't there, after today? <laughs> if I do my job good, if I get on well with you and convince you of our education system, we're going to have more friends. You're going to come to Dublin. You're going to come to Ireland. You'll want to talk to me and learn about the education system. You probably think this is Ireland. So the four people, so we have four people here that know that this, this is in Ireland, that we have gone ahead of this, okay? Now, um, the organization that I work 
for. It's a big organisation. It deals with all the public education in Dublin. It's the largest education <coughs> body, and we work a lot with the Ministry for Education. So we are really represent the Ministry for Education, and I do a lot of work for the Ministry as well, for the international. And when Lithuania was joining the European Union, I was one of the people <coughs> in Dublin that welcomed all of your colleagues to Dublin and introduced them to the education system in Ireland because at that time, a number of years ago, a number of countries like Romania, Hungary, Poland, all of these countries uh, came to Ireland because Ireland was designated as one of the 10 countries with a recommended education system. So we're in business together now. And from what I heard, you're after catching up on us. So you could be passing us out at the moment. That's why I was delighted to get the invitation to come here and to be able to maybe steal some of your, your, your progress that you have made in recent years. Because any time we want to improve the education system in Ireland, I go around Europe with colleagues and we look at what other people have done. And we find out what they weren't happy about and the improvements that they have made so now we capture the best of all opportunities and we can put that together in the system. So you will know that we went through a bad time, the same as any country. We had a financial crisis. We thought that, say, some years ago, we, were, we thought we were the richest country in Europe. We thought that we knew everything. But that was a big mistake. Never, never think you know everything because we don't. We're always learning. Like I'm 40 years in the business and I'm still looking forward to learning more. That's why I want to engage with you. That's why I want you engaging with me. And if you have something to ask, ask a question because that's the way it is. Rather than sit and listen to a monologue, find out what's in this for me. You know, what, what did I spot in this that I could make my situation better? How could I make my classroom better? How could I make my lectures better? Or how can I run my school better? Or how can I make the Ministry of Education better? You know, for everybody. Now, this is the model, so uh, everybody should be interested in it. And watch out during the presentation because there are things that you would say, oh, I could do that. That's good for me. That would be good for our system. Why not? If, they've, if they have a, made a success of it in Ireland, sure. That's only a small little country, five million people. It's an island. And what do they know about education? Now, in Ireland, we try and make things simple. That's the, that's the secret to life. Keep it simple, don't get complicated, and you'll do much better. This is what we're trying to do. These are the levels here. The early childhood runs nicely into the primary school section. After that, post-primary, you have your lower secondary, you have your upper secondary, and then you have this new level of education, Further education, it's the VET section, the <coughs> vocational education and training. And it's a very good section for generating employment and preparing young people for work. So that's, that's well worth having a look at. That's roughly the number of people. And you can see if we've only about 5 million people, 20% uh, of them are in education. So that will tell you education is very, very important to people in Ireland. It's like a passport to people. That's the way parents in Ireland look at education. If you haven't got money, what else have you got? Your education. So education is a passport and you try and get to the highest level possible because that's where you're going to get the best salary You know, when you start working. That there gives you an idea of the background. Ireland is a well-known Catholic country, and the schools, the primary schools, are 90% of them, or whatever they are, 91% of them. So that's our background. Now, that's changing slightly, and we're getting a, you know, a bigger mixture of people, and a bigger mixture of education. 
the OECD, if you look at that, you know, the, that's, say, a way of judging standards and things. And from what I see, you're about to join the OECD in June. There's a big conference coming up. Fena, is that right? It, that's, so that, that's, a good, that's a good measure, and that's a good step in the right direction for everybody here. <coughs> uh, overall, we'd, we'd regard that as a good thing. If our primary school teachers are putting more hours into, more contact hours with the children at that level, why not you try it here, or why not other countries try it out if it's working? Because if you look at the next slide, 90% of students in Ireland finish out their lower and upper secondary. We're the leading country in Europe because we don't really know why we do in one sense we know because of all the structures that we're trying to develop and all the good things that we're trying to do and trying to make it, the education system inclusive for everybody so that everybody can feel ownership of it. Because after all, if you're employed by the government, if you're in education, you represent the government. We are the government. We are the people that make our future. So every one of us has that responsibility. It's not, some people say, oh, what are they doing about that? What's the ministry doing about that? What's the school doing about that? We are the ministry. We are the school. We are, we are education. Now, the access to third level, that's another thing we've been very good at. We're getting 97% of our students, when they finish their upper secondary, they have access to university or to third level. So there's great strides in that as well. And there's lots of things that you could enjoy, you know, learning about, you could enjoy uh, wondering how are they doing it or how is it working. So it's really the investment here. There's great investment in the education system at the lower levels, in primary, second level. But at third level, we are making parents pay some money for third level. We don't have enough of money to put the same money in or the same resources. Because in Ireland, the self-employed people are not in the tax net the same as the PAYE people. So if you give grants and free education to third level and to people at all levels, the self-employed, say farmers and business people, uh, anybody that has a big business, they can actually get grants, they can get free education. That's just the way the system, that's the way the tax structure works in Ireland and we're, we're trying to change that so that it can be more even. And that's why there is a student services grant at third level. There's about 3,000 euro people have to pay, and that captures everybody then, unless you're, you know, unless you're uh, in a special category where you deserve support from the government. You can get that support, but otherwise, everybody else is caught, be it no matter what level you are, you're caught for your, your 3,000 for third level. Of course, uh, the other, the other areas are, you know, are subsidised, you know, greatly. Now, this is something else about the Irish system. Overall, in the OECD, about four out of five students say they're happy. Everybody should say they're happy at school. Why shouldn't they? Why should 25% of your class be unhappy? Or why should 25% of your university students be unhappy? It doesn't make sense. Glasser said everybody should be happy. There should be no failures in, in schools. You know, every student should be a success. And it's up to us to turn that into reality. And if you look at, say, on average, the principals agree with it. The principals are even saying it's worse, 71%, a little bit worse. And so that's something that uh, everybody should be conscious about. But in Ireland, look, 100%. Uh, say that they want to look after the students, they want to make sure that a student's time in school is happy. So how does that happen? It happens because there are competencies here that when I'm interviewing teachers for jobs or I'm interviewing principals for schools, I will want to know what is their attitude towards duty of care for students. That's a big competency. What is, 
it's not just the education of the student in Ireland that we're interested in. We're interested in the whole student. We want him to be happy. We want him to learn. We want him to be a success. And teachers in Ireland will have that competency. And this is something I found from my interaction with uh, other countries when they come to visit Ireland. They are a little surprised at the level of duty of care that the students actually implement in the classroom with their students. They're like, they're like uh, substitute parents, they're like mentors for the students. And it works in reality. It's not, it's not, it's not a rule or a regulation. It's reality that happens in the classroom. It happens in the culture of the education system. Uh, the Europe, as you know, the European model is eight. There are eight levels in the European model. We put in ten. We want it to be a bit different. Good to be different, isn't it? You know, make your own out of things. So we put in two extra ones for the, you know, for the primary, for the primary school and for, say, for the uh, non-formal education that, that happens and, and uh, you know, the progress that people make. And again, look, there it is. Try and keep it simple. We have only one year for preschool. Lots of other countries have a much better system than us. But we can't afford it at the moment. So we're happy with the one year. Three to four years, the government will subsidise and help the parents. Otherwise, they'll have to, they'll have to pay, the, you know, pay for the children themselves. We have the primary then. And there are no exams in the first, couple, in the, in the first eight years, no exams. Then we have the, the uh, mainstream, we have a transition year. That's something too you could be interested in. What happened in Ireland is that the students were going too early to university. They were reaching university at 17, going into a big campus and they're not a great duty of care. I'm not saying anything no, bad about universities, but all I'm saying is that universities is a big model, a big campus. Uh, they don't, uh, wouldn't, and sometimes the culture may not have that, you know, capacity to look after very young students. They end up in the bar, like all young people, and go a little bit astray. I see some people smiling. There's just our, our line up there, we, we can skip that. So the good years, I mentioned 15 years ago, we, were, we had the best quality of life in Europe. And why had we? Why would you think? Tell me. Why did we think we had the best style of life in, in, in Europe? What were we doing? Where, where were we going wrong? You're all very wise people. Tell me. <laughs> Come on now. Don't be so quiet and shy. We're living on the banks. Yeah, we're borrowing money from the banks. We're all buying, you know, getting pre-approved loans for the bank. Get a letter in the post, it's lovely. Uh, I, dear Mr. Hogan, I'm delighted that, to inform you or confirm that you now have a pre-approved loan for 20,000. You can pop off and buy a new car for yourself. And, you know, but, yeah, of course, people, you know, didn't think about how they'd pay it back. And then when we hit on hard times, people lost their jobs. You hadn't got your salary to pay back your uh, new car, pay back your mortgage, or pay back your loan. So this, this, uh, that's the reality to life. Uh, okay, uh, the civil service, uh, the Department of Education. As I said, we're the Department of Education. We're trying to save, ch change things. The universities in Ireland are combining things. Say Dublin City University is a new university is joining up with the teacher training colleges to try and save money. Institutes of technology around the country are joining up. And uh, you, you know about maybe Trinity College, big university stands alone, University College Dublin, or the University of Ireland is kind of a big unit. So it's the smaller units that the government is putting together to have a better quality of education for the students, a better quality of education for the teachers, to try and make better use of our resources. <coughs> So the crash was great. The recession is good because it gets us more creative, more inventive, brings us back to life, back to reality. 
you know, people, you know, when you're in a big bubble and you have lots of money, you're employing people to do your ironing and your washing and your gardening and your cleaning. You forget, you forget how to live life. But now we're, we're re, re, reunited now with reality again. So it was the best thing ever happened that Ireland went through this because we now can become more creative, more innovative, and we can be more self-sufficient again and more confident about things. So don't worry if things get a bit bad. Every 15 years they'll go up and down, but you will be better for it. Is that all right? Time? Yeah, OK. Banga says it's time, she's calling time. <laughs> now, the rest you know, so I hope that you are happy with that and, and that, uh, you know, that I have, what would you say, generated an interest and generated uh, enthusiasm, you know, within yourselves as well for the education system. So no matter what level where you are, that you will think that you can make a difference and go out there and... You know, do what, do what you think is going to make a difference for people. And I'm, you know, very grateful to be here. And I've, we've done a lot of work with Connors University in research projects because, as I said, when, when we have a need, we go and look and we find out what has been done and we're delighted to be able to benefit from all of your experience as well. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. We are really prepared very well to be more close to Dublin because we open direct plane, direct uh, flight, flight yes. to Kaunas, Dublin. Yes. And I would like to invite the people from this, uh, especially from Lithuania, to use this possibility and yeah. to visit Dublin because really I think we are really so happy to have John as a friend and I think it was fantastic, very enthusiastic presentation and useful for us. No, it's only 90 euros with Ryanair. Oh. <laughs> and I don't work for Ryanair. Uh, I have a question. Oh, yes, yes. yes. Yeah. Mr. Rose, yes. I'd like to, uh, you mentioned as one of the uh, criteria for employment the uh, ability to show care, right? How do you assess them? Do you have a good test or how do you make it technically? It's very easy to assess it because uh, you can see the teachers in interacting with the students and you can see the willingness of the students to come and uh, discuss problems with their teachers and, and, if, and you can also you can, you can detect it uh, if there's any bullying going on in classes or if, if the students are unhappy like the students feel comfortable in, in, uh, in discussing things with their teachers is that what you mean? Yes. Yes. So do you have some procedures for continuous assessment or at, at the station of teachers? oh yes yeah, yeah. of course yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's ongoing, the yeah, continuous <laughs> assessment, yes. <laughs> Thanks. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you, John. And yeah. John will stay during coffee day with us. And now I would like to invite our next speaker, France. It sounds, how to pronounce it in the right format? Your name? Francia. Francia from UK. <laughs> no, sorry, you know, I, I, ask, uh, I know how to pronounce but I, I would like to underline it sounds very nice. And uh, now, really, uh, we are happy again to have uh, re really very, very professional people in our conference. And now, the floor is yours, please. Thank you. A number of uh, people have spoken about innovation, about bringing about change. But what I want to do is to explore with you what lies underneath it. Because if you want to bring about change, if you want to bring about change, you've got to understand what stops change happening. And this isn't about the big systems and processes and structures. This is about what happens between people because you may have amazing policies, you may have amazing ideas, but at the end of the day, it's an individual person that's got to make things happen. So I hope to be able to pick up some of the things that Svetlana has spoken about and that other colleagues have also spoken about. So for me, there are two things. 
And when I've worked with school leaders, for example, they have also reiterated this. There's two things in that change is either something you decide for yourself to bring about innovation, or otherwise somebody has said you have got to do it. And those two things give rise to quite a different feeling <coughs> about whether you're going to go with this or not. So mandated change, you have no choice. There is very low autonomy. But if it's self-initiated, if you decide something has got to change, things have got to move, you're quite, quite differently predisposed to it. You've certainly got to understand your organization and the leader, which for us is the big thing because we're involved in this big leadership project, their attitude and their experience of bringing about change is fundamental to this happen. Somebody spoke about a carrot and a stick. That's part of it. But there's a whole range of other strategies. And as a leader, you need to have that wide repertoire so that you can judge it correctly because you can't carrot or stick every single person. You need this range. And my other point, it's not about managing change, it is fundamentally about being able to lead change and that's quite a different dynamic. So some of you, I'm not going to cover this, but I want to talk about metaphors. You'll be familiar with Lewin's work, with Cotter, but I want to just remind you about Morgan and the idea of metaphors. I've worked with many schools and many institutions and we've been through the documentation and the mission statement and the values and the philosophy and all the documentation says, yes, look at our results. We are a brilliant institution. We're doing this, we're doing that. The mission statement says that we are caring and sharing. And then I say to them, just off the top of your head, give me a metaphor that describes your institution. And I had some schools, for example, where we had spent half a year improving the school, working on developing the school. They spoke about how caring and sharing the school was, and their metaphors were unbelievable. I remember one deputy head of a school said, um, the school is like a carousel you know, one of those things in a fairground that goes round and round. Or another one said, my school is like a roller coaster, up and down like this at a fairground. People spoke about bubbles, <coughs> people spoke about ships. And I said to them, do you realize we have spent all this time talking about how caring, sharing, warm <coughs> the school is, and you have given me examples of inanimate objects these are metal objects. And do you realize you've said to me that if you get onto a carousel or if you get onto a roller coaster, <coughs> once you're on, can you get off? No, you can't get off. Do you have any choice about where you're going? No. Wherever it's going to go, you just stay on the right and then you get off. What is that actually saying about how you feel deep inside about your institution. So the metaphors that Morgan offers and a whole range of other people who've written about metaphors are very useful devices for exploring. Talks about machines, organisms, as a brain, culture, prisons, prisons. There's a range. Interesting things to explore. So think about it. What kind of a metaphor would you use to describe your own institution? And what does it say about your relationship with your institution? Because you may be in it, you may be outside it. It may be that you feel that you have control or you are totally powerless within this. If you have been told to bring about change, in reality, do you stand any chance? Do you even want to? There's really quite important things 
to think about, that I want to explore as I move on. Now, many of you will have seen the iceberg, but every time I've worked with uh, managers or leaders in institutions or in schools, I've given them a blank one of these and I've asked them to fill in what they think should be there at the top and what's underneath. And at the moment, mine looks like this. So these have come from real people. At the top, there is the vision. All those very user-friendly words where, you know, caring, sharing, we're part of an organisation, we're a team that cares, and so on. And it's uh, structured or delivered in terms of the policies, the regulations, job descriptions, all of that on the top, but when you look underneath, you see something completely different. Think about, and Svetlana spoke about trust. It is there. It's there embedded within the ethos. <coughs> and you can get different layers because different people believe and they see their organization in quite different ways. The leader, the, the rector, the vice chancellor at the top, to the person at the bottom who is a new lecturer within a university who has just joined and they've been there for six months. What experience are they getting? Ethos, this thing that you, you can't touch it, but you feel it. You walk into a school or an institution and it feels, does it feel buzzy? Does it feel like, oh God, I really want you know, I've been into schools and I've thought, oh, I wouldn't mind being a child here. It feels so wonderful to be here. I feel I could develop, I could grow. But some places you go into, you want to go in and out as quickly as possible. There are things to do with the private cultures, little cliques of people that have their own little empires. There are attitudes that people show towards one another. But is that dependent on your status? Or is that, you know, show of attitude and respect shown also to the people who do the cleaning, who are part-time teachers, who are only there for one or two hours as lecturing staff? Is it shown to everybody? Or is it only to a few? What do we think about, what about respect? What about if you have a personal aspirations, you know, you want to develop, you want to grow, are there opportunities for you within the institution for that to happen or not? Or is it only for some people? Because more and more I'm seeing for some people. At the bottom, success and rewards for those in the know or whose faces fit. If you have hidden rules, if you've got a silent majority that never ever speak out, what you end up with is a situation where quite frankly there is no psychological safety. That if you speak out of turn or if you say actually I don't agree with this, I don't think you've done your homework and I think the impact of this, whatever it is, is going to be such and such. Some people feel that if they speak out, that they will be repercussions. They may not get the promotion, or they will be passed over. Or next time they go with an idea, a big idea to their head of department, the head of department's going to say, I'm sorry, we haven't got the money for it, or... Um, we'll put it on the agenda for next year. All of these things happen when there is no psychological safety, where you cannot speak out. There are things like the well-being that John spoke about. The well-being is not just for the students, it's also there for the staff. I have spoken to teachers in schools who have said to me that they are there for the children, sharing, caring, picking up all the pieces, but nobody is doing that for them. They've said that 
they have walked down the corridor and a head teacher or a senior teacher has just walked past them and they haven't even said good morning and they feel that they're not listened to at all. It doesn't work. If you want to create an institution where change happens, where people are willing to give you the, the, you know, the benefit of the doubt, where they're willing to take risks, then you need to have a collegiate experience. You need to have people that feel, you know, the institution cares for me and I'm going to give it my 110%. You cannot have power networks. You can't have cliques. Imagine you have decided, right, I'm going to do this amazing uh, ICT project and this is going to re revolutionise uh, students' learning. Okay, so you go to the named person and you say, look, I've costed it out, here's my plan, I've changed the curriculum, these are my ideas for changes in pedagogy, and you present it. And they look at it and say, thank you very much, Francia, I'll come back to you. And they go and talk to their friends, friends who I'm trying to be transparent, here it is, and they say, what do you think about her idea? And people go, uh, heard it before. It's not the right time. Actually, it's going to need money, and um, we haven't got the money. And uh, this and this and this. And they come back to me and say, I'm sorry. Well, next year. Well, put it on the agenda. If you've got things like that <coughs> happening, where there is no transparency in the way that decisions are made, then we have problems. Because, you know, it's a bit like the child in class. The teacher asks a question, the children put their hands up, and then you never get answered. And you're like this, and your hands up. And the next time the teacher asks a question, you think, well, I'm never going to be asked. So, and you can't have that in a system because the quality of an organization is dependent on the people that work there, you know, the lecturers. It isn't just the students, but it's all the wider adult, in a sense, force. The students, of course, but there's a whole range of other people who have ideas, who are innovative, who have creative understanding and great experience. But are they asked? Are they listened to? So, the barriers to change, because it's only in understanding this that we can make change happen effectively. So, the thing I would take from that is that context specific. You need to think about where your school or your organization is in its life cycle, because there are times when it needs maintenance and there are times when you're at rock bottom and you need ideas and change can happen differently in terms of how quickly it can happen and how quickly people will allow it to happen depending on where it is. But if you've had an organisation and I've spoken to plenty of schools where they said we've got overload, it's change after change after change and nobody even gives us a moment to breathe so we can implement it and work it through. No, because next year we've got another few changes, whatever the flavour of the month is. There are two areas here that you've got to understand. One is, does the problem essentially come, or the resistance come from the institution itself, or does it come from the people? So, if you think about the institutional resistance, this is going to be, this is all hidden stuff. Unless you know where to look for it, you're not going to pick it up, or certainly not pick up all of this. You can have change not locked into strategic development. It can be the wrong time frame. You know, like I just said, we're just exhausted. We cannot cope with one more change. The organisational culture has an inbuilt inflexibility. Essentially, they change things. You've got new titles, and underneath it, you've got the same old, same old. So I have a new title, and for the first few months, I'm going to be doing this, I'm going to be showing that, I'm going to be developing 
having meetings, working parties, and then I revert back to type. Same old, same old. My mindset, what's happening in my head hasn't changed. Just the words have changed. And then it goes back to my old mindset. You can have inexperienced and inflexible managers who lack charisma in terms of leading change. How is it that some people can lead a group of people across the Antarctic and these men know that they are unlikely to survive, but people will follow them to the ends of the earth? They haven't been paid extra, they haven't been bullied, they just do it because this individual is so charismatic. People believe in them. And there are some people who really have no charisma. They believe because it is their title that they can tell people to bring about change. And this is the timeline <coughs> and you will do it or not. There are threats to existing power holders and that causes problematic uh, There's a, a lack of a fresh view of a situation. And it could be that the organization carries a very, very poor experience of managing change. It's never worked before. But look at the individual resistance. <coughs> what if I lack a trust in those leading the change? What if it hasn't been made clear to me why or justified why? What if I wasn't even asked, if there is no consultation? What if, in bringing about this change, I suddenly find that I have lost my role and my identity, and now I carry no status? How does that make me feel? What if I fear the unknown or the future? What happens where I'm going to have to be retrained to understand all this IT business? What about life? You get middle people in the mid middle and senior levels of management who have life to deal with. Change happening at work, change happening at home. You know, the children have gone off to university, the husband's left you for the secretary, I suddenly feel really old, I've got elderly parents, all of that life. If you have got major changes happening at home, it's very, very difficult to deal with major changes happening at work as well and bring in a balance. Right. I'm just going to flick through these. You need to work it through. You've got to have a conversation. This story, it's got to be mapped out because this change has got to be justified in your terms. You've got to understand why it's got to happen and then you've got to feel about whether you can commit to it. And there's a big discussion that happens around this that I've mapped out here because it enables you as an intelligent person to be able to make decisions. It's not just a question of somebody says, you do this and you do it. This is about you making decisions and with you come all sorts of other people and you're able to work things through with honesty and integrity. If I pull things together, the key thing to take away from this is that if you experience change in a positive way, it can enable you to grow. It is transformational. It can help you to understand the world in a different way. It could be that five years ago you had never ever picked up technology of any sort. Now you do it even without thinking. There was a time when you didn't even think that you could actually do this, and now you can do it. It's the way that the process takes place and the way that you engage with it. It offers 
you know, you have a critical set of experiences if you're able to go through them in an effective way, if you're able to experience positive elements and you don't feel so stressed that you back away, it can be an opportunity for creativity and for transformational change. And you see the world in a different way and it opens up new horizons, new ideas, and it is worth it. The more you collaborate across countries, the more you talk to different people, as John has said, as other people have spoken about in terms of um, working with people in other projects, you begin to see that everybody sees the world in a slightly different way, and that really is to be taken <coughs> on board and to be appreciated, because it's only through those experiences that we see that we are capable of change, and we have got flexibility of mind. You just need, to, sometimes you need somebody to be able to take you through it so that you can have a positive experience. Thank you very much. So you are saying so loudly, but it was so silent in the audience. I think we are teachers, and for us it was very, very interesting. And now I would like to thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and now I would like to invite our speaker from Ukraine, Professor Andrew Gutkavichin. Yeah. But before they are uh, made copy of the file, a few sentences about proceedings. Uh, we will publish our papers in our, your papers in our proceedings uh, in, 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 in during the summer time, and we are waiting full last version, very good quality of your papers, till the end of this month. Till now we have 34 papers, and I'm so happy about that, because now we understood that what we are doing today is very useful for us, and I would like wish to all of you, if you are, didn't write, and didn't send papers to us, please do that during a few weeks, three weeks. And now, the floor is yours, please. Thank you, Dangole. Good morning. I think still <coughs> morning, ladies and gentlemen. And it's my honor to finish the first session presenting some ideas what is the role of the university in this changing environment. Actually, all we know that in, uh, a lot of changes are going on in contemporary societies. And um, uh, the transformation of university also depends on several factors. First of all, on external environment, but as well uh, on in, in, in inner culture of the university. And referring to Francia presentation, I think that if university, uh, according to Morgan's uh, metaphors, is organization prison or organization machine, uh, it can't be truly innovative, right? <laughs> so, what is the university that can adapt to changing environment, can be innovative in our uh, nowadays uh, society? So I uh, will present some uh, thoughts about uh, the challenges and solutions uh, uh, of the role of university and its ability to adapt to changing environment and mainly maybe using ideas of management and entrepreneurship. So uh, I will start uh, my presentation briefly um, from the context, the Lithuanian context uh, that uh, perceives a lot of changes uh, and uh, has some problems as immigration. For example, during the last 10 years, Lithuanian population was constantly decreasing by uh, uh, 0 0.7 or uh, even 1.5 percent per year, with especially high rates in 2005 and in 2010. Uh, emigration is still big, and if we consider immigration rates, so they are not, they are a little bit growing, but uh, they are still rather low. 
Uh, if we consider GDP, so it has been growing from 2010, so I think the same uh, situation as an island, as you've mentioned, uh, but it has reached the level of 2008 just in 2012. Uh, also, unemployment uh, level is uh, rather high, it's above 10%, and if we consider youth unemployment, so it's even bigger, uh, it's uh, above 20%. So, all these, um, uh, all these uh, uh, demographical and economical uh, trends uh, uh, say that uh, uh, actually, uh, population, they are more, then they talk about problems in Lithuania, <coughs> they are more focused on economic and uh, social issues. Uh, these are data from representative survey of Lithuanian population and you see the most important problems in Lithuania are perceived as being low income of population, unemployment, <coughs> emigration, corruption, delinquency. And you cannot see education here. So uh, education, uh, educational system was on the list, but uh, uh, then we analyze perceptions and attitudes of Lithuanian population towards education. You see that Lithuanian population do not see education and ed uh, educational policy as a very important problem in Lithuania. So we can be a little bit uh, relaxed, uh, everything is quite good, because just 2 and 0.5% uh, of respondents indicated that they see uh, education as the most important problem in Lithuania. Uh, actually, the first speaker, Baino Brezdekis, was presenting uh, trends in a policy, educational policy. So here you see the other coin of the issue, how people, how Lithuanian population evaluate uh, different policies uh, and the performance of diff different policies. So you see, um, uh, educational policy is, uh, has been evaluated quite uh, uh, good in relation to the performance of other uh, policies. Uh, overall, uh, the performance uh, and implementation of uh, policies uh, has been evaluated uh, not very good because five is uh, very bad and one was very good. So you see all the policies has been evaluated below 2.5. That means uh, more uh, uh, bad than good. But educational policy is uh, rather, uh, uh, rather uh, on the top. Uh, uh, but still, if we consider Lithuanian population and uh, the level of satisfaction, uh, for example, answering the question, how satisfied are you with opportunities to get education? 90% of respondents still are unsatisfied or uh, even very unsatisfied. Or uh, considering the question, how proud are you with Lithuanian achievements in science and technology? Even the 31.5% uh, of respondents <coughs> are not proud uh, uh, or not proud at all with Lithuanian achievements. So all these indicate that there are some trends that uh, uh, foster, foster university to change. And uh, the directions of the change can be very uh, broad and uh, you can find a lot of alternatives where to go, how to change. One of the possibilities is to focus university activities uh, uh, as uh, uh, manage, uh, manage, uh, like implement in uh, all uh, university activities managerial philosophy and start uh, uh, counting and uh, evaluating its performance. So, uh, if we consider innovativeness, entrepreneurship, uh, can we speak about academic entrepreneurship as well? And uh, uh, 
some of the literature present the positive answer that academic entrepreneurship as, uh, can be considered as creation or sizing of opportunities within a university, regardless the resources available. And uh, uh, that's why in contemporary society we perceive some tendency to incorporate management ideology into the strategy of the university, <coughs> meaning uh, to integrate all organizational functions like marketing, finances, budgeting, design, uh, etc., and focus to, uh, on meeting customer needs, customer uh, perceiving students or uh, uh, external uh, uh, social partners and organizational objectives. So uh, there are kind of the two trends like meeting consumer needs and continuous improvement of organizational uh, performance. Is it good or bad? What do you think? There is much of a debate. Those who support this uh, uh, view say, okay, university is more effective, we can calculate everything, and uh, you can predict. But uh, there is much of a debate and a lot of supporters, uh, and uh, this uh, position per, uh, gets a lot of criticism. Because uh, uh, if you speak about uh, like meeting consumer needs, what are the consumer needs? Just to get a diploma or really to get knowledge? Sometimes even uh, who is consumer in that uh, at then. Uh, the next stream of criticism is about control and management. Uh, if we put everything in a very strict frame, where is uh, the academic freedom? And the last uh, st like trend of criticism is about standardization of a product. So. In this framework, in very strict managerial framework, can university be very innovative? So having in mind this, uh, th this debate, and um, uh, of course all these uh, views have positive and negative aspects, uh, still we, I think that we can speak about the university and its entrepreneurship abilities. Like, uh, uh, Actually, implementation of ideas of entrepreneurship help universities to create, first of all, competitive advantage, address students' uh, customers' needs more properly, and generate wealth. So uh, you can find a lot of ways uh, uh, how to implement entrepreneurship ideas into university life and activities. But one of the ideas can be to find more effective learning tools and more innovative learning content. So uh, actually, uh, I was doing research on these two trends uh, mm -hmm. since 2013. Uh, first, uh, in 2014-15, uh, concentrating on innovative tools of our learning and uh, leaving uh, innov innovations in content of subjects <coughs> for the next steps of uh, uh, the investigation. Uh, so uh, the uh, methods of investigation is just qualitative, uh, having interviews with different uh, representative of uh, universities and incorporating all levels uh, of actors uh, starting from administrative uh, staff, uh, teachers and students. So uh, what are the preliminary uh, conclusions? Uh, I think the positive context uh, <coughs> uh, fosters implementation of uh, new learning tools. Like uh, the impact of ICT on pedagogical approaches is evident and acknowledged by all actors of academic community. It's acknowledged even by those actors and in those cases then it is not fully implemented. So it, it doesn't depend the uh, uh, university has an emphasis on ICT uh, development uh, uh, or doesn't in the strategy. and. It doesn't depend on a level of the uh, like uh, usage of ICT in everyday uh, everyday uh, learning process, but all uh, 
all teachers, all administrative staff, all students, they all emphasize this, uh, the importance of ICT implementation. Uh, the next idea is that uh, the intensive support uh, technological method metho methodological uh, fosters at large the implementation and use of new learning and teaching tools. So uh, then the help is received. Uh, all uh, everybody is more willing to use ICT. Uh, also, what I found that actually. Uh, uh, external grants are very sufficiently help implementation of the uh, uh, new learning uh, tools. Actually, participation in different international and national projects, the innovative pedagogies are developed, tested and piloted with larger groups of students. Uh, all this fosters implementation of innovative tools. And uh, maybe I leave examples. Uh, aside, and uh, but still, uh, considering everything, there are still challenges uh, uh, that are evident in everyday life, in everyday study process. Unfortunately, there is no clear evidence that new modes of teaching and learning uh, solutions solve issues of study success and study programs in a degree programs. Also, new modes of teaching and learning can be a factor in the cost of the course uh, in the short or medium term, but maybe not in the long term. Sometimes there is, uh, enough in uh, sometimes there is not enough uh, in in institutional capacity to accelerate the implementation of new modes of teaching and learning, like budget doesn't allow. The main barriers uh, for the implementation <coughs> of new modes of teaching and learning lack teachers' motivation and uh, the, uh, what uh, was emphasized by, especially by students, that is quite low spectrum of software used and not sufficient, maybe sometimes, knowledge of teachers. So finally, I would end my presentation with some possible solutions that uh, actually raising awareness uh, of lay people is very important. So in that context, uh, uh, MOOCs for everybody is very important thing and um, solution. Uh, or, uh, as well, informal learning uh, and training of uh, trainers who can spread these ideas is also very important and uh, of course motivational system would support the implementation of new uh, learning tools in a uh, university's life. So thank you. Thank you very much. Fantastic. We are exactly in time. <laughs> thank you very much. All speakers really was very, very professional. Maybe some questions to Anglia? If not, uh, I would like to invite you to coffee break because uh, this is two places for coffee break. We have one hour and during this time we will divide this room into two rooms.
to, to, to invite you for the second session, and it's really my great pleasure to invite to open the session our uh, big friend, <laughs> big friend not only Lithuania, but also big friend of Ukraine, Professor Olaf Arna, who is from uh, Estonian Business School, uh, with the presentation strategies and approaches of continuing and professional development. Olaf, please, you have about 15, 20 minutes, yeah? Thank you, Svetlana. Лабадена, доброго дня, дорогие коллеги. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, it's indeed a great pleasure for me to be here in Kaunas after one year when we had a kick-off meeting uh, of Tempus project uh, in the same building. Actually, I slightly reformulated uh, the topic of my, of my presentation because I understood that what is printed in your agenda was the general uh, general topic of, of this session. But uh, but my decision is, is to or was to concentrate more on qualification system as one of the vehicles supporting uh, continuous and professional uh, development. And of course, it's always better to base it uh, in what you really know and then during the last six plus years I've been deeply involved in developing qualification system in my country. But let's, let's start to the very important uh, concept of, of competence, or competency, uh, which is a really, really tricky tricky concept, but on the other hand, uh, this concept uh, is a cornerstone uh, in, in nearly everything uh, around uh, lifelong learning. And my understanding uh, of this concept of competence uh, is that, that actually this concept has two faces. On one hand, if we are looking uh, on the notion of competence from the side of a society or particularly labor market, then competence means being able to perform certain tasks, to perform certain functions, which are one face of this dual uh, notion of competence, ability to perform necessary tasks. If we look at the same concept from the side of, a, of an individual learning during whole of his or her life, then competence means to have knowledge, skills, attitudes necessary to perform these tasks. And these two aspects together form competence, not only one or the other, but all were both these together. And therefore, even for a university, it's not only to acquire knowledge, but uh, first and foremost, for me, to be able to apply this knowledge to perform different tasks in society, in your personal life, in your working life. And tightly rely, uh, related to, to the notion of, of competence is uh, another central co concept of qualification. I admit that this is not the only definition of, of qualifications, but uh, qualification. But again, in the context of lifelong learning, uh, at least during the last seven years, uh, it has been agreed that qualification means officially recognized com competence of a person assessed and validated by a competent body. This competent body particularly 
could be some committee uh, at a university, it can be uh, some body uh, attached to a professional association, different options. And, and the, in this context, uh, I would say that, uh, let's say, uh, wordings like uh, improving your, your, compet uh, your qualification uh, uh, is somewhat uh, tricky. In developing qualification system in, in my country, in Estonia, we have taken the following fairly simple guiding principles. Uh, first and foremost, we have introduced a concept of a qualification system as an interface between the society on one hand and the system for lifelong learning and particularly occupational qualification system, the system dealing with uh, work-based qualifications quite often not required from any kind of education and training uh, institution is a particular case of qualification. It is an interface between the labor market and the system for lifelong learning. In Estonia, we consciously adopted uh, the so-called integrated approach to the qualification system where all kinds of qualifications, and I, I'm going to tell uh, later on what types of qualifications I have in uh, mind, all types of qualifications are included into the same system uh, of qualifications, and this seems to be uh, gradually becoming a uh, general approach uh, across Europe concerning the development of qualification system. And finally, which is also extremely important, in this approach, more or less automatically, uh, the qualification system by itself becomes a quality assurance, uh, an overall quality assurance system. What I mean uh, can be best explained using uh, this scheme uh, or picture here I, I used to call competence <coughs> circle because the basic concept across uh, this picture is competence. Uh, so first and foremost, uh, qualification system as an interface, uh, interface between the society and the system for lifelong learning, so the part of the pic uh, picture between vertical dotted uh, lines, and it, it has two major avenues. On one hand, inside this qualification system, the expected competence or competencies are extracted from society first tasks performed or expected tasks performed uh, defined they are defined as descriptions of competencies, particularly in terms of knowledge, skills and, and attitudes. And using these descriptions of competencies as building blocks, different qualification standards are developed, particularly occupational qualification standards. The latter the qualification standards are used for two purposes. First, and probably not first, at least for me, not first, but let's say first for as an input to develop study programs. In some occasions, as an intermediate step, we develop national or core curricula, and these are in turn used to, to develop already curricula and study programs and education and training <coughs> institution. On the other hand, qualification standards can be used to assess <coughs> the real competence of persons who wish so. And for these purposes, either as a part of qualification standard 
or independently assessment standards <coughs> are developed. And this leads me to another avenue, the avenue uh, describing uh, assessment, validation and certification of persons' competence. And uh, this is a generalized picture of any kind of qualification uh, system in potentially any country, but it has helped us uh, to really conceptualize what we are dealing with. And what I, why I say that by definition uh, the qualification system as an interface between society and uh, the system for lifelong learning is automatically a quality assurance system is because according to the definition of ISO 9000 uh, for quality, quality as a degree of correspondence uh, between a set of characteristics of, a, of an entity, particularly education, uh, what is expected by stakeholders and what we observe rea in reality. So both aspects, what is expected by stakeholders is defined in qualification standards and what particular person really has is assessed here. So in a way, according to this model, we really build a quality assurance system for qualifications, let's say, awarded in a particular country in a, or in a particular sector. Uh, of education and training in, in this country. I'm not uh, stopping on institutions involved on a state level into this. It is a separate topic and for my dear Ukrainian colleagues, uh, if you like, so I can deal uh, with this topic in more detail uh, when you come to Tallinn next, uh, next week. Particularly in developing, uh, developing uh, the system I am uh, talking about uh, is the Estonian Qualifications Authority I've been working with uh, during the last six plus uh, years and then which is particularly responsible for the occupational qualification system. But at the same time, this authority is also responsible only uh, with the occupational qualifications, but also with other types of qualifications in, uh, awarded inside the formal education system. Qualifications in general education, in vocational education and training, and qualifications in higher education. This is the picture describing the organizational structure for the part of the system called occupational qualification system which uh, has certain uh, quite quite a lot of similarity with the system uh, in uh, in England in Scotland in also somewhat less uh, in Ireland because these countries have served uh, as an example for developing our own system uh, during the first decade of, of this century. A couple of more words about uh, the types of qualifications involved in this uh, integrated qualifications system. So on one hand, uh, three types of qualifications which can be acquired from the traditional or more or less traditional formal education system. Qualifications in general education, upper secondary, 
and, uh, and lower secondary uh, level. Quite diverse qualifications of initial and continuous vocational education and training and four types of qualifications in higher education varies why four <coughs> types uh, let me say uh, Svetlana explained uh, the new developments in Ukraine which include also the so-called Bologna short cycle uh, qualifications I must add by, uh, to be correct, short cycle inside first cycle, which means that these short cycle study programs and qualifications have to be by definition uh, part of certain, certain bachelor's uh, qualifications. We don't have this, this short cycle, but, but nevertheless we have vocational education and training qualifications on the same fifth level <coughs> of the qualification framework. But we have two types of bachelor's, uh, bachelor's qualifications, more academically oriented and, and more professionally, <coughs> professionally oriented uh, qualifications in parallel, which is also, I wouldn't say uh, in all countries, but in many countries, they are explicitly divided into academic and and, uh, and professional in some countries, there is, let's say, like in, in UK, as far as I know, it is just a continuum of, of different uh, bachelor's programs covering uh, all, uh, both extremes as well. And finally, why in, in red, uh, these are, are the occupational or sectoral or, or work based qualifications uh, which are included in our system and as, as I said uh, gradually systems are developing in such a direction that more and more countries uh, starting to integrate this type of qualifications also into their national qualification systems. This kind of a qualification system is based on competencies, is based on learning outcomes and it means that it needs learning outcomes based uh, or competence based qualification standards which are listed here concerning my country uh, Estonia. Again I am not going into, into details. Uh, being an engineer, I like schemes and, and pictures uh, to explain something. So this picture explains uh, the structure uh, or the architecture uh, of our qualifications frame, framework with, with eight levels qualification framework uh, identical to EQF uh, by by definitions of, of levels and uh, four sub frameworks for general education, for wet, for higher education and for occupational qualifications and, and all types of qualifications are reference to this backbone of, of the system. In many occasions uh, it is not the case uh, instead uh, there is a single uh, qualifications framework uh, and, uh, and just uh, directly all the qualifications or, type or types of qualifications are referenced uh, to this national, single national qualifications framework. It is up to, to a country to do. This picture is, uh, John, you recognize the Irish, uh, Irish uh, origin, original uh, contextualized uh, with Estonian, uh, with Estonian uh, levels and, and, and qualifications but we found it, it graphically very very good, uh, good uh, nearly self-explanatory that's why you can also find this picture on the 
uh, on the website of, of our qualifications authority. This table here explains how different types of, uh, of formal education qualifications are referenced to eight, eight levels of, uh, of the Estonian qualifications framework, which are uh, in one-to-one -one correspondence with eight levels of, of the EQF. And finally, why I say it uh, in the beginning that uh, I'm deeply convinced uh, that uh, uh, this in integrated qualifications framework uh, is a good device to support not only transparency and, and understandability of the qualifications, but also to support professional, continuous professional development uh, of people, people because uh, you can uh, you can see, uh, let's see uh, that uh, in the, the, the list of occupational qualifications contains not only qualifications which can be awarded uh, in higher education institutions or let's say in, in upper secondary school, but, but it also includes qualifications which uh, are entirely work-based and, and can be awarded, let's say, by professional associations only, but they describe, let's say, the career path, the potential career path in, inside certain vocations or, or professions and and uh, if people wish so, they can use these qualification standards, work-based qualification standards, to self-assess their competence. And if they wish, they can also ask for official certification of their competences. And particularly, let's say, the qualifications of chartered engineer or chartered architect are used uh, in some cases uh, uh, for accessibility to international tenders uh, in, in specific uh, projects. But uh, this is just one uh, example. The same uh, can be applied for teachers or any, any other profession. So, in totality, we have something like 500 plus uh, occupational qualification standards. Most of them are used for, uh, for developing study programs and for, for validation and certification of competences. Some of them only for assessment, validation and certification of competences. So, and first conclusion I already told, it is, to my best understanding, a good device to support professional development and recognition of competencies. <coughs> what I would like to stress is that qualification frameworks, even if they are referenced to the uh, EQF, it doesn't mean automatic recognition, but it is a step to, towards, uh, towards uh, mutual recognition of qualifications, uh, just making them more transparent and comparable. And, and I already said that nearly by definition, it is an important part of the national quality assurance system for qualifications and studies. Thank you so much. We have a question, maybe? Oh, if it's possible, very, very short answer. I just to specify, you mentioned that uh, now you are working on development of new occupation standards. What is the new, new function or new methodological approach? Uh, actually, both. Uh -huh. uh, uh, in a way, we are on a third 
let's say round of round, yes. de round of developing occupational standards and, and since 2010 uh, our occupational standards are fully competence based and and, and these 500 plus standards are all all competence based on the other hand uh, uh, there is a constant uh, review and re renewal of of the standards because you have to follow changing needs of society and and and, and labor market and uh, therefore uh, each and every four or four or five years they are reviewed and if necessary uh, amendments introduced okay thank you Olaf. and i i have task from the organizer also to present you uh, souvenir from Kalmas Technological <laughs> University. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Sveta. Thank you. So, <clears throat> it's my great pleasure to, to invite the next speaker. Uh, this is Dr. Gintare Tautkavicene. I am really sorry. <laughs> it's okay? It's okay. <laughs> and uh, from Kaunas University of Technology and with the presentation the needs for researchers information competence development and I, uh, I look at the program and I see that today we will have a really good possibilities to look at the educational process from different factors. Now about researchers. Okay. Welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. It's my pleasure to be here and to have possibility to, to introduce uh, the results of my research. Um, the research was carried out in the frame of the project, a model BLT, opening uh, of the online research database for Lithuania. This project is second stage of the project. First one was in 2009-2012, and second stage was uh, in May 2012, and will uh, finish in September 2015. It's, this project is co-financed by the European Union structural funds and the government of Lithuania. And main goal of this project, subscription of databases and developing information competence of researchers. Uh, research was organized uh, around the very simple idea of research projects, which uh, consists of four stages search and retrieve information, how to use and cite information, how to publish papers and articles, and how to get cited and increase visibility uh, worldwide or internationally. The aim of research to assess the researcher's information competence and determine the researcher's need for developing information competence. The scope of research, basic and advanced information searching skills, information searching strategy, tools and experience, knowledge about research evaluation met metrics, tools and open access, uh, copyright, citation, reference management tools, and demand for information competence development. So from this uh, topics, we developed questionnaires and the research was carried out uh, in April 2015, so we have very fresh data. Uh, we used internet-based internet questionnaire to collect data from researchers. It was filled out uh, about 1,000 questionnaires, however, fully filled questionnaires was 494. Uh, biggest uh, number of researchers come from universities, but also researchers from institutes and colleges also take part in this uh, uh, survey. 34% uh, of researchers which take part in this uh, survey are students, it's doctoral and master students. Um, Researchers represent different age group. Biggest group is researchers in their 40s. Then the younger researcher, uh, under 30. And uh, a little bit more or less, researchers come from the group uh, under 50 years. Uh, 
Research uh, have different uh, research experience uh, and uh, biggest uh, group of researchers are doctoral students and lecturers, associate professors, and a little bit less research com comes from the group, from assistants, uh, professor, and master <coughs> students. So we have uh, opinion from different uh, uh, researchers groups. Researchers carry out research in different areas. However, a bigger number of researchers are from social sciences. Uh, some of researchers carry out research in two groups, uh, in multidisciplinary area. Uh, what findings we get from this uh, survey? We asked researchers about how do they search uh, scientific information, and uh, bigger number of researchers use uh, universal search engines like Google, subscribe databases, specialized search, search engines. However, specialized tools like library catalog or academic databases or scientific search engines are used only by some researchers. When we ask researchers about uh, uh, how, how do they get up-to-date information, current information, what do they need for research, uh, most of researchers browse subscribe journals. Also, they get information from uh, researchers' social network like ResearchGate, ResearchAD, or com communicate with colleagues directly or using electronic means. However, only a small part of researcher address the library asking for help and support, and very few of them use specialized tool for current awareness. So tools like RCC feeds or alerts are used only by a small number of researchers. Uh, when it comes to full text documents retrieval, we get answers that researchers use the same tools like for searching information. They use universal search, search engines, subscribe databases, or specialized search engines. But we realize that uh, uh, most of uh, researchers don't understand that they can access full text document uh, only in this case if, if the university or the library subscribe to these resources. So they think that everything is available on the internet and they can use uh, a Google for information search and it is uh, it's, it's enough for them. And only uh, one set of uh, researchers ask for help and support from library staff or use interlibrary loan. And we also try to learn what is uh, researchers' knowledge about research evaluation tools, which tools do they use, which metrics do they know, and we realize that uh, quite a big number of researchers never search or never was interesting about uh, metrics and uh, only a small number of researchers know how to search for main uh, research evaluation metrics like impact factor, age index, uh, or, or uh, country, or subject ranking, or, or so on. So researchers need help to, to learn uh, this, uh, this information. We also were interested about uh, their knowledge how to properly use uh, information resources when they write uh, papers or articles. And we realized that 43.3% of researchers don't know which citation style they use. 
Uh, biggest number of research is 27.7 use APA citation style and it's not surprising because uh, most of researchers who participate at this research comes from social sciences. And uh, other cit citation style are used uh, less often. We are also very interesting about uh, do researchers use reference manage management tool? It's very convenient tools when you write in papers or articles. Uh, and <coughs> we get uh, answers that 62.6% of researchers do their uh, references uh, by hand. They don't use any special software, and we can see that uh, uh, about 40 percent, 14 uh, percent uh, researchers <coughs> use uh, commercial products like RefWorks or EndNote, and um, uh, open sources use only uh, 9 or 7 percent of researchers like Mendeley or Zotero. We also were interested about uh, the knowledge, do they know how ethical or legal use information when they uh, do some writings. Uh, and uh, we realized that researchers are quite competent, they know how to use uh, information in their uh, writings. <laughs> They know how to cite, how to make references, uh, how to publish. Uh, they are familiar with copyright law. And um, this shows that in this area, the situation is quite good. Now it's very popular uh, discuss about open science, open access, open educational resources. However, when we ask researchers, uh, do they use open access resources? Do they search for these resources? Uh, it shows that uh, researchers search for articles in open access journals, and only a small, small part of researchers search for open access resources in the institutional repositories. And uh, about 40% of researchers don't know or never use open access resources when they search for information. We also were interested about publication in the open access. And we can see that uh, uh, almost 50% of researchers publish their articles in open access journals or submit to institutional or subject repositories. Uh, also, they publish in the commercial open access journals, paying some article processing charge. But uh, I was very surprised uh, when we received answer that researchers also submit research data to repositories. Why I was so surprised? Because in Lithuania, we have one uh, data repository uh, for social science, art, and humanities. It's called LIDA. And as far as I know, uh, there are not so many submissions to this repository. So I don't know where researchers put this data, in which repository. Uh, we also were interested about uh, information competence development need. What kind? Uh, of uh, training do they need, what topics they are interested in. And we, we asked what they need by themselves. Researchers, uh, from the researchers' answer, we can see that they need training in research evaluation <coughs> metrics and tools, uh, 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 information about uh, e-resources in, and interactive technologies copyright and prevention of plagiarism, reference management tools, how to find journal for publishing, about open access. We also ask them what training do need students. And uh, researchers think that 
student needs uh, at least uh, simple search and information uh, and training about uh, searching information from the subscribe databases, from the library, and uh, also they need uh, training how to uh, about copyright prevention of plagiarism. It means how to use the information uh, when they do some assignment work. What type of training do researchers need? Actually, we can see from the results that researchers want to be trained face-to-face -face, uh, and they need more practical training uh, with computers, but also they like uh, uh, training material, what is put on the internet. So it have to have uh, uh, researchers want to be self-directed learning. Uh, actually, education, distance education courses are also on demand and about 40% want to be uh, trained by distance education courses, but also traditional lectures are <coughs> also on the request. What conclusion can we draw from this research? Um, we can see from the answer of researchers that uh, researchers should have possibility to choose different courses where they can learn about novelties of uh, about technological novelties and new information resources and in, in that way update their knowledge. They also think that uh, training for students should be compulsory. Also they say that uh, they want to learn in small group and uh, uh, those groups should be divided by fields of science and by level of the information competence. Some researchers want to be to have individual consultation and support, and beginner should uh, only be introduced to the basic information and about searching tool and databases. So that uh, was uh, basic finding from my research. And if you have some questions, I will be happy to answer to them. Have any questions to Gentara? <coughs> okay. It's possible to very quick question. Okay. Yes. Uh, first of all, uh, how do are you planning to use this result? Maybe to update your doctoral programs, or just to inform Ministry of Education that it's necessary to improve doctoral studies program. Actually, this um, research was carried out the second time. First uh -huh. time we used quite similar questionnaire in 2009. Uh -huh. And according to the results, we organized training for researchers. We, we did quite a big uh, training, and participants of this training was more than 1,000 researchers. Okay. And great. now we also <laughs> are planning to update uh, new training uh -huh. material. OK, great. And the second question, uh, you mentioned that the biggest group uh, of researchers now in Lisbeni, if I understand correctly, is youngest researchers. Is it the result of uh, staff policy on national level or uh, institutional level? Actually, it only pa participants. Uh, only participants. Yes, not typical. Because situation. it was voluntary uh, to okay. fill this questionnaire. It okay. was not mandatory, and we don't know who filled this questionnaire okay. because okay, it was answer. sent only by internet. Okay. So. Thank you very much. I think we have to thank Gintera for great presentation. <laughs> and next, the next speaker is. Uh, Associate Professor uh, Vai Dotas Trinkunas. Is it correct? Yes. <laughs> I'm <am> sorry. <laughs> and your topic is Distance Education Network in Lithuania. Yeah? Yes. You're welcome. Hello for everybody, and uh, my presentation will be about the distance education network in Lithuania, and uh, uh, this is uh, more technical uh, 
uh, side uh, of learning uh, uh, and uh, uh, we are responsible for the making uh, possibilities for uh, learning process uh, from technological side. And uh, our network con consists of uh, higher education institutions uh, and uh, on this moment uh, we have uh, 15 uh, different institutions. Uh, you, you can see here the list of those institutions, uh, uh, various uh, universities and uh, some, some colleges. Uh, uh, there are uh, biggest institutions in Lithuania. Uh, and our network is uh, working from year 2010. It means that uh, we are working five years. And uh, the main principle uh, of uh, uh, our consortia is uh, cooperation uh, in uh, Lithuanian distance uh, ed education network uh, support and development tools, uh, tools uh, combining. Uh, those uh, four things, it's orga organizational potential, uh, technical and uh, technological capabilities, uh, also financial potential and uh, uh, what is also important is professional knowledge and skills. Uh, we have uh, uh, several services uh, which uh, uh, we are proposing for our members. Uh, it is, uh, uh, sorry it's in Lithuanian. Uh, it's a video conferencing infrastructure, uh, video lectures infrastructure. Uh, we have about, uh, on this moment, about two and a half thousand uh, different uh, uh, video rec records. Uh, uh, also, we, are, we, we have uh, uh, centralized uh, virtual uh, learning environment, uh, which uh, can use our member institutions. Uh, also, uh, teaching uh, for, uh, for our members. Uh, now we are, part uh, we are participating in one program. It's a Lithuanian Science and Study Information Infrastructure Development Program. Uh, and uh, we just uh, finished uh, one project. It's, uh, the it was the national project. Uh, uh, which titled the uh, development of uh, Lithuanian distance education network. Uh, if we briefly talk about those uh, two projects, uh, the first one is uh, uh, for the uh, keeping existing uh, distance education system uh, and the second one is for improvement uh, of uh, existing system. It's uh, for new technological decisions uh, <coughs> and uh, uh, for implementing <coughs> new things. If we talk about uh, the first project, it, it <coughs> consists of uh, four main topics. It's uh, hardware and software technological support, as, as I said, and development uh, of different software extensions, uh, which is necessary for each, each day learning process, uh, uh, processes uh, for optimization uh, and improvement of distance learning, and uh, users' uh, training and consultancy. Uh, we think that the last one is also very important because just implementing of te technological and soft software decisions. Uh, it doesn't mean that uh, institutions will use those in each day life in the learning process because of it uh, we pay quite big attention for the training and consulting uh, and uh, it's, it's we are organizing uh, trainings and consulting uh, for each, each institution member institution separately and one time per year we have big seminar we where uh, each member can 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 meet, where members of this consortia can meet meet each others uh, and uh, um, share those experiences in distance learning process. Uh, 
uh, under the uh, second project, uh, which, uh, as I said, we just finished. It's half year, a little bit more than half year when we finished it. Uh, uh, we implemented the desktop video conferencing uh, system, new uh, desktop video desktop uh, desktop video conferencing system, which. Uh, have uh, less requirements uh, for network uh, uh, quality, uh, for internet uh, connection quality, uh, which uh, where it's not necessary to have uh, uh, very good quality cameras and uh, other equipment uh, for uh, video conferencing. And uh, uh, after implementing this uh, uh, system, we have a possibility uh, to organize uh, video lectures for all students, uh, what, what was quite difficult uh, uh, before because equipment uh, was very expensive uh, and now uh, there is minimum requirements uh, for technological side, uh, side and uh, each student uh, can use uh, his laptop uh, and participate in video conference. Uh, also we uh, prepared uh, some methodological materials for distance learning uh, processes. Uh, uh, also, what was uh, very important for us, uh, we development, developed a uh, help desk line for distance education network. Uh, also, established uh, virtual methodological support center. Uh, organized uh, members training. Uh, uh, also, we created uh, some smart modules uh, for our virtual learning environment. Uh, and I briefly represent about those things. And as I said, uh, desktop video conferencing system. Uh, we used video uh, system. Uh, not video, but video is uh, uh, the title of the system. And uh, we have uh, the possibility to make 75 parallel connections uh, with uh, both sides uh, uh, conferencing. If we are talking about just listening uh, or uh, webcasting, it's possible to have 300 connections uh, at, at the same time. We have 7,500 uh, licenses. And uh, what is uh, important, it, the system is adopted uh, for Different, uh, different operating systems. It's Windows, uh, Mac, uh, Android, and others. And it means that uh, for video conferencing, it's possible to use not only the computers, but also uh, smartphones uh, and uh, the tablet PC and other, other devices. <coughs> other devices. Uh, and also we have uh, very good uh, video uh, recording uh, possibilities. Uh, if we talk about uh, freeware software, uh, which is possible to find on the internet, uh, uh, we, we tested different so solutions. Uh, and uh, when we talk about more than 10 connections, we have problems. If we talk about uh, video recording, we also have problems. Uh, this, with this solution, uh, we, we solved all those questions. And after first year using, we are using this approximately one year. Uh, the students uh, are very pleased about the system and they said that it's really, really uh, good improvement in those learning process. And here you can see uh, uh, help desk uh, print screen and uh, we, we split it into three main parts. It's, uh, uh, about video conferencing one part, uh, uh, other part is about video lecturing and uh, one more technical side, it's uh, uh, Moodle virtual environment. Uh, we had, uh, as I said, we had some uh, courses and trainings uh, because uh, uh, one, one of the reasons uh, was new technological uh, decisions and uh, uh, how to use those uh, in uh, learning process. We don't want that, uh, that just to keep those solutions. We, we wanted to inform uh, our members about the possibility to use those decisions. Uh, and uh, there was uh, five topics of uh, 
uh, courses and trainings which we had last year. Uh, and uh, as I said, we developed uh, some smart modules for our virtual environment. The uh, idea was that it's uh, not enough information about uh, uh, learning process in uh, our current virtual environments. Uh, most of the institutions uh, they are using uh, as virtual environment Moodle system, and uh, in this system it's uh, quite difficult to get uh, some information to, to make uh, some decisions mm -hmm. and we split uh, star, uh, smart modules uh, into two types, into in two groups. Uh, one type, uh, one group is uh, uh, for students and teacher support and there is analysis of users' activity, uh, sending actual <coughs> information about uh, users' activity, activating uh, passive courses members. Uh, another part is uh, support for administra administra administrative uh, staff. And uh, we are not stopped on this. Uh, uh, this project we stopped and for the future we have also quite a lot of uh, ideas. Uh, uh, we on this moment, we have adapt in statistical information about learning process in different institutions, member institutions. Uh, we are developing distance learning information system, uh, which will help uh, for us to manage, to plan the development uh, of uh, our network uh, in the future. Another direction is uh, creating interactive uh, learning laboratories. If we talk not ab about the separate courses, but if we talk about uh, learning programs, and we have different uh, uh, laboratory experiments, especially in technological sciences, uh, uh, distance learning students have limited possibilities to do it. And in the world, there are a lot of decisions uh, for this, and we are trying to go by this direction also. It's creating interactive uh, learning laboratories, which, is post, uh, which can use uh, all our member institutions. Uh, improvement <coughs> and, and development of virtual learning environment, uh, also development of uh, video conferencing system, because uh, uh, 75 uh, connections at one time, and uh, uh, it's, it's not enough for us, and uh, there is uh, a recording cap uh, limit for uh, rec recording capabilities, so we, we want to improve those also. And uh, what is quite popular at this moment, uh, it's uh, MOOC, uh, Master for Open Online Courses, and we would like to pay some attention for this also. Thank you. Uh, members of your network, individuals or universities? Universities, universities. And colleges. Yeah. That, what do you think? What is the main motivator to join to your network for the universities? Yes, uh, sharing of uh, te technological. Technological uh, infrastructure. Uh, infra infrastructure, yes, among institutions, uh, the institutions can save. Uh, in, on investing in technological infrastructure, also sharing of knowledges. Uh, and experience. Uh, expert support, yeah? Yes, expert support. Okay, thank you very much, Faidutas. And also, I would like to present you this cup. And I understand this is souvenir not only for you, but also Vilnius Gediminas Technical University from Kaunas Technical University. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, next speaker. Uh, will represent the result, I think, uh, uh, of uh, research team, Dr. Edita Butrime. Yeah? And uh, from uh, Lithuanian University of Health Sciences. And the topic of the speech is Digital Native Student Attitude on learning using KS titles. Welcome. Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, Dear colleagues, it's an honor to be here. Uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Vaiva Zuzevich Uti. I'm from Nicholas Romeris University, and it is a privilege to be here and to present the ideas of my dear and, and sophisticated and dedicated colleague, Edita Butrime from Lithuanian uh, Health Sciences 
university. Uh, but uh, since uh, this is a recorded thing, we decided not to distract uh, the camera. On the other hand, it's uh, a little bit scary how these things start uh, uh, start organizing our life. So it's a privilege to be here, it's a privilege to be uh, among friends, it's a privilege to meet friends, I hope, uh, newly made ones from since uh, Tuesday. And to talk to you a little bit about uh, how digital natives, uh, whom we think uh, are so sophisticated and so competent and so active in, uh, in the virtual environment that we try to create for them, how do they really then, in the end, uh, use those opportunities that there are out for them, that we all here, everyone, is participating in creating those opportunities for them. Uh, as I already mentioned uh, uh, in this conference, I'm the one with a critical mind. I, um, I'm always questioning, are those uh, uh, technologies that are there, are they really <coughs> helping us, or maybe they are making us lazier? If we had to do things the old way, maybe we would have been doing them instead of uh, not doing, instead of getting lazy. If we save sometimes, sometime due to technologies, are we using the time wisely? Are we using the time to take care of our family better? Are we using the time of, um, for taking care of our fam um, friends better? So that's, that's me. I'm always a little bit cautious about using technologies without not thinking what is it that they are bringing into our lives. But as a, an academy pe person, as a person representing a university, you may well see it's still there that we are representing three universities and we talk between our, each other and I'm sure you do the same. We became a little bit cautious also about what young people are doing with all the technologies coming into their life. Specifically, do they use those for their learning, which we want them to do? And I would skip, because uh, uh, I, I am aware of the time that we are a little uh, behind the schedule of the agenda. So the parameters are clear. We have a problem question, and the problem question goes, why students who are using ICT tools eagerly for everyday life seem quite relac reluctant, be aware of seem, because, well, maybe they aren't. That's why we went and went and, um, decided to make a, an empirical study. Seem reluctant to use ICT tools, for the, further on we just uh, use the e-learning term, for studies. How come we, as university teachers, find it so difficult for them to read what we publish, to read what we upload, to make a presentation according to requirements that are on the line. Maybe, maybe it's just our experience. Maybe that's not what they student, what our students think. So digital, digital natives, I don't have to remind in this auditorium, these would be people uh, born after 1982. And uh, Mr. Pransky was one of those uh, people who coined uh, the term, and since then it's, it's, uh, it's a common knowledge. Uh, we also have uh, quite a lot of, um, quite a lot of uh, characteristics why it's good to have technologies for studies as well, as if we have to be talked into that. Of course it's good to have technologies. Of course it's good to have a car. Of course it's good to have a tractor. Of course it's good to have a computer. But the thing is, that the car could be used to bring ammunition into the front line. And the computer might be used to do something else, maybe even illegal things. And the cybersecurity issues are, you know, on the way now. How to protect our, well, actually, bank accounts. But on the other hand, the car may be used to bring a diseased person in time into hospital, and the computer might be used to learn better, to learn more effectively. <coughs> so we all know that all the things would be used both for the better, on the other hand, it may serve 
evil purposes as well. So digital natives spend too much time. I hope that everyone will agree with me. We would like them to play basketball or baseball or football or whatever, but no, they are there. They are spending their time in virtual, uh, virtual environment instead of making generous <coughs> and genuine friendships. And uh, of course, it's good to have digital, com digital contents. Of course, it's, it's, it provides us with such a wonderful opportunity to use many people to react on one thing, to use the wisdom of people in Australia to react to my mistake and correct me in time, to use the intelligence out there in South America to help me to expand on and enhance my ideas if they are correct. These are general knowledge. Of course, we do agree. That's what com uh, technologists and also digital uh, technologists could be doing if we are using them wisely. Uh, however, and we were pleasantly surprised that those three uh, ladies, uh, three representatives of Lithuanian universities, are not alone in their uh, concern. That's not exactly what young people are doing. There are studies already that already tell us that it's a worldwide problem. Young people are not using the computer, the digitalized opportunities for the best they could. For example, uh, one of the uh, research uh, is uh, quoted here, the students perceive themselves as fairly competent in most areas, although the data does not indicate that these competences are necessarily refle reflected in the normal performance of academic tasks. And this is of, the st study comes of 2012. And elsewhere, they, the, the young people, create their own groups independent of the official communication spaces in the virtual campuses, which is good, which would be good if they would be, if they are still working on the academic tasks. But are they? And uh, then why, why we have the situation like this? And it's a privilege for me to present the hypothesis formulated by my dear colleague, uh, Dr. Edita Butrimer. There might be three hypotheses. And colleagues, it's hypothesis. Please react, please tell. We have later on some time for discussion, so you may say what you feel. The first hypothesis goes, young people may be simply not, may, they, maybe they are simply not aware that something that they use for leisure, time, <coughs> is <coughs> the same or very similar that they could be using for studies. It may be that they do not translate that the Facebook thing could be also used, or very similar thing to Facebook, could be also used for your studies. Maybe these are, in their minds, so, so distinct, they cannot see the similarity here. Uh, who knows? This is one hypothesis. The second hypothesis goes, when we go into university, or we go into bank, or we go into school, or when we go into a store, we know physically that's the store, that's the bank, that's the university, that's the school. It may end what's important. When we go into bank, and we are, when we are doing a, a trans, uh, uh, transfer from my account into a digital account, or vice versa, which I prefer, but never mind, uh, we understand if it's a bank, then we, adult people, we mature people, we understand if, if that's a bank and I'm using this bank's virtual system to make a transfer, transference. It may be, and it's a hypothesis, we don't really know yet, that young people do not think that way. They do not connect in their mind, this is University X and this university has this virtual platform for studies and learning. They're so used to Facebook, YouTube, you name it, that they think this is a universal reality, the reality that, you know, promotes all of their lives. And they cannot understand that this is the physical building university having its 
virtual environment into which they have to switch on and use it and use it according to the rules of this specific university. Maybe it's not that they're lazy. Maybe it's not that they, they are reluctant to use. Maybe that's the connection that they are not making in their minds, which we do. We understand, OK, that's the bank. That's the virtual platform I'm using. That's University X. I'm using one uh, platform. If I work for another university, I use the platform of another university. And that's it. That's fine. I'm not asking my teacher, use the Facebook which our students in all three universities, the authors of this presentation, ask us to do. Oh, teacher, forget. Please upload that on the Facebook. And when we try to explain them, come on, this is for once, it's a copyright thing. You know, I'm a teacher. I have those slides made. And this particular university paid for those slides. So why should it be, you know, here, on, for everyone? Another thing, they have to register, they have to uh, send in assignment in time, they have to get assessment in time, and it's done during this particular virtual environment. It's impossible to do that on Facebook. Everyone will know that you got 10, or everyone in the world would know that you got one. The, maybe that's the problem. Maybe, we don't know. And the third hypothesis comes, <laughs> I like this one. Mr. Uh, well, Several decades ago, McCluskey told us, let's see, you know, we are biological entities. We can do only as much as we can with an energy as much as we are allocated. And that's it. There are so many tasks, and we have to divide our energy and as many things. And if we are doing many, many, many things, that small amount of energy goes into those numerous tasks I, have to, I, have, I, I am doing. And when, when we are too, uh, talking about multitasking, my dears, what is it that we are talking about? We are saying that we are doing many things, but superficially. And it's not because we are lazy. It's because we are biological entities and we have only a given amount of energy. If I do one thing, which is I'm doing now, and I thank you, you are very, <laughs> thank you, you are all on this presentation. <laughs> thank you for that. I see that you are into this. I'm doing one thing. I'm concentrating on it. I'm, I'm trying to find the best way to explain what I'm up, up to. So it's more or less done properly. But when I'm doing, I don't know, 100 things, which our young people are doing, so how deep is the performance? How well they are doing that? By the way, as, as to, that's why the mobile phone is forbidden while driving because we become dangerous to others, because we are not concentrating on what we are doing there. So I like Mr. McCleskey's explanation as well. We have as many things to do as, as, as we do. So what is it that I want to convey here is, it may be that he or she then filters through his or her life the layers. And the first layers that get filtered away is something I don't know. The student doesn't really know this platform of this university and just filters that away. With him, with her, stays those layers that he or she is familiar with. That face. And then he or she keeps asking you teachers, you know, upload the material on Facebook and leave me alone for God's sake. I will do the test. Just make it easier for me. Maybe that's the explanation. Maybe it's not. Is the hypothesis as the previous two were. So research methods, we made, uh, we understand that the series of, um, of uh, uh, tests are needed and we are thinking about qual qualitative uh, in-depth study as well. For the time being, it's a pilot study. We have representatives from those three universities. You see the distribution. It's more than 100 students we are invited. As you may see, the, some of them were born and started using computer maybe the day after. And they are using internet also. They were born, two, lays, two years later they started using computer. So when we asked them, they were open and closed type questions, this one, the clo closed one, one. So attractiveness of internet tools for students liked, I like that very much. Or I don't like that very much, you know, the like it scale. So you see, using internet for students, <coughs> 32% 
contemporary person. 2014-2015. It just it's it's just a uh, half a year ago we we started the the, the the study. So internet, which seems to be my best friend ever for studies, which is my students' first test, I use 32% of, of respondents answered that they do. I uh, used internet tools only occasionally for my individual learning before I came to this universe to do this. 60% who said, yes, yeah, okay, only occasionally. I have other things to do. You know, studies, learning, come on. I have other things to do. And how often you use internet during the last five months when you already you know, you know, here in this university, because we started in December, so we are there already. And as you see, often, but then often would be all, all, only 43% of respondents. Constantly, only, well, not only, not even 30%. I don't know your reaction to this one, but I'm really discouraged. I'm really discouraged. Why is it that young people who we, whom we think to be digital natives, who are always in the screen instead of playing basketball, why is it they don't transform those opportunities for learning, for studies? Maybe one of those hypotheses explain things. Maybe not. We really not yet uh, aware of that. And uh, students assess their own experience. You see that well, they are quite happy about what they personally can do uh, with the tools uh, available. <coughs> and students apply ICT opportunities for learning. You may see that uh, in those three universities. Uh, none of those people represent technical sciences, social sciences, health sciences. Uh, so we may believe that more or less this is the reality. You see that, uh, well, they think they are okay. So that's why the studies are so important. You think you are okay in one question, but the other more deep question shows you and researchers and all the others, oh, really? Really? And students see on the application of the ICT in the study process, communication and social networks. What is it that 90% are doing in social networks for studies? Tell me, who knows? What is it that they are writing about? What is it that they are chatting about? This is, this is the professor whom you should avoid. You know, this is the assignment that almost killed me. What is it that they are using that? Or is it that they're helping each other? You know, that's what I found. Maybe you would want to quote that. We don't know. We are not checking. We are not, you know, some filing agency. That's why we will do qualitative phase after this one. But you see, that's what they are doing. Virtual communication chat audio. That shows 67%. Uh, we work hard. 20 hours per day, we, we use Prezi, Microsoft, uh, PowerPoint, whatever. And then not, this is not everyone that really takes advantage of the materials. We worked on very hard. And uh, the application of the internet for search for supplementary materials online, that killed me, 60%. I would thought 96.9, but now 60% of students. So what is it that they are doing in those? I don't know, I really don't know. And uh, students feel implication of I see in the program. I think that more or less. And I am well aware that my time is off and the conclusions, I think the best thing is to make our own conclusions here because if we knew the answer, we would tell you the best answer we came up with. We are those three hypotheses we shared with you. And step by step, with each series of empiric studies, we are going to check one, the, the first, the second, and the third. Thank you so much, so much for attention. Thank you. <laughs> so, I'm really sorry that I announced another speaker, but I was not sure who from your team wrote uh, my presentation. But I know that all of us question to you. Maybe uh, during lunch time. Really? Like, uh, and I would like to invite the uh, uh, next speaker. This is Judita Castellunia. Uh, and um, uh, 
topic is Try for Sociality, Technology Enhanced Learning in a Community Organization. And uh, Judith is from Vitas Magnus University. Hello, everybody. So my name is uh, Judita Kasperunene, and uh, now we'll switch to the communities, to rural communities. And uh, uh, I will talk uh, uh, about the research that we just uh, done uh, uh, about how uh, technology enhanced learning is going to the communities. So uh, uh, the aim of that research was uh, uh, to explore what is going. Uh, how the community members learn? Um, do do we face um, some barriers for learning, uh, or maybe uh, we have uh, a lot of challenges? Uh, or it could be that in communities everything is it's uh, very good. So uh, um, we chose uh, uh, a rural community in the middle of Lithuania. It was uh, a, a small community, uh, population approximately uh, 2,000, more than 2,000. Uh, it was an isolated community. Um, they, uh, they are a bit uh, compact, uh, uh, they live all together, they have close relationships uh, inside the community. Uh, but uh, uh, also the interesting thing is that uh, there are not so much workplaces inside the community. So a lot of people, they, they are going, uh, they, they are having a job in town. Uh, the community is located nearby uh, one of the biggest towns of Lithuania, and uh, uh, the population is uh, rather young. Uh, that means that uh, uh, in, in, inside the community we have uh, uh, a lot of young adults and also students. So. Uh, 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 the data, it, it was uh, a qualitative research, so uh, we did uh, uh, some semi-structural interviews, but uh, uh, we, we had some specific structure, how, how we structured we, these interviews, because we had uh, some specific criteria groups, uh, um, uh, technology enhanced learning uh, uh, integration criteria. So uh, we asked these persons about uh, strategy and management, uh, how they manage the community center. Uh, because uh, such a, a community center uh, rules uh, the, um, all the life of that community. They manage how it goes inside the community. Uh, also, we asked about uh, technology enhanced learning curriculum and programs. Uh, do we have some programs? Do we need them? Uh, how the learning is going and such things? Also, uh, the resources of community center. Uh, do we have some technological resources, uh, uh, hard resources, uh, uh, soft resources and such things? Uh, continuous professional skill development, quality assurance. What do we think about that? Uh, learning support system, is it such? If it is, how it goes? How do we think about that? And uh, similar things. And also uh, marketing plus business development. Because this is a community center. Uh, this is about the uh, rural community. So how, how they uh, imagine? Do, do we see some problems, challenges? And such things, uh, uh, how, how, we, how we will live and how we are living. So, uh, because I think we need to be very short and quick, so I just switch to the results analysis. Uh, this is a, a present and active uh, today's situation in that community. Uh, this is technology enhanced learning in the middle. And uh, we see uh, the influences or uh, who, who are the main actors in that uh, community. Uh, so people talked about technological literacy. Uh, it's very important uh, not just to students, uh, not just to teachers, because uh, we talked about uh, uh, teacher competence development in another in Lithuanian section. Uh, but this is also very important to communities as well uh, about the organization strategy. 
uh, and also about community microclimate. Uh, inside the community microclimate, we see organizational environment, social and cultural environment, plus uh, uh, financial things, because this is also influenced a lot. But uh, uh, financial potency also could see in this in, in the uh, left part, uh, because inside the community, uh, if, if we are talking about technology enhanced learning, uh, everything depends on uh, project activities. Uh, if we don't have projects, uh, uh, they will not have uh, financial strength. Uh, it's also very important social partners plus infrastructure development. Um, implementation, technology enhanced learning implementation into a community center. Mm -hmm. So uh, here you could see uh, seven uh, criteria that I described in, in the uh, uh, previous slide. And uh, is it criteria applicable or not applicable? Uh, is it uh, uh, implemented or not implemented to that rural, small rural community? So uh, if we're talking about strategy and management, so this is uh, partly implemented. And I could see that uh, uh, somehow it's, the situation is similar uh, in many communities. Maybe these communities differ and it could be that uh, um, in isolated uh, communities somewhere in, in the middle of Lithuania is not the same as, as in, in border uh, to, uh, to, to Belarus or, or uh, so Latvia or some, some other community, but in general the, the picture is almost the same. So, uh, about the learning curriculum, this is the second number, uh, this number two. Uh, it's also partly implemented, that means that uh, um, respondents, they, uh, they uh, know how it could go. Uh, they know uh, which type of courses they would like to have. Uh, they know uh, also, uh, which, uh, which topics they, they would like uh, to learn and such things. Resources, um, that community, some, pe some respondents, they are talking, they, they have resources and it's enough. And you see that uh, other persons, they are saying, no, we even don't have the resources. So that means that uh, maybe um, so, some of the respondents, they they don't understand uh, even the question that uh, um, uh, maybe uh, they have their own technologies, they have technologies at home and this is enough for them. And from other side, uh, mm -hmm. uh, maybe they need technologies uh, located in, in, for example, community center building and they need to go and, and uh, uh, to see the computers and work with computers in the building, but uh, not at home. So this is also questionable. Um, continuous professional development, uh, you see that uh, uh, all the respondents, uh, they understand the value of all this uh, continuous professional development. Uh, quality assurance, uh, this is depends uh, on uh, mainly on the project that I implemented, on the project activities, uh, and uh, in general, um, in all the projects that, that are running in, in the communities, um, we have uh, external lectors uh, for the courses uh, and external experts. That means that uh, uh, mainly these external experts are uh, experts in general, the experts of, of that uh, subject, so the quality is good. Uh, about the support system, uh, they, they said that it's partly implemented, and about the marketing and business plan, this is depends on the community leaders. I need to be very quick. Yes, yeah, so uh, let's go to the conclusions that uh, uh, you could see, uh, if, if you look up, you could see the advantages. So as the advantage, uh, uh, they, uh, the community use the principles of learning organization and this is uh, the biggest advantage and microclimate is good. 
uh, and uh, uh, organizational strategy oriented to the continuous development and learning. But the main challenge that is written in red that uh, is uh, uh, not really realize the value of technology enhanced learning. We still think that uh, learning in a classroom, uh, learning when you sit all together in a community building is better than uh, uh, learning online, sitting in front of your computer and uh, uh, listening to a virtual lecture, but not talking to real lecture. So, and also financial potential, it depends on the project activities and cannot be properly planned. Because the project, it could come, it could not come, you will need to, to write the proposal, it would be accepted, not accepted, and also it's, it depends. Um, and uh, uh, also we as a researchers and uh, the same our respondents, so uh, they themselves, they suggested how they would like uh, uh, to, uh, to stimulate the process of technology enhanced learning in a community. And the main point was uh, that technology could help to build the community. So they need to communicate and uh, they need to communicate using the technologies, mainly social networks. So uh, how, um, how we did that? Uh, we, we propose uh, uh, to make a, uh, a course, an e learning course, about communication and collaboration. So we did such course, and uh, the course was online in that community. And the main challenge or uh, the main uh, uh, good thing from that course that uh, uh, community members later on, they started uh, the community account uh, on Facebook. So uh, uh, if uh, uh, that community previously, they communicated uh, just uh, uh, on phone or, or just uh, meeting and chatting, so later on they started that Facebook account and on that Facebook account, it was not just, uh, uh, you know, talks and chats that, that they, they, they are doing, but also they proposed uh, some information, they talked about events that are going, and uh, they disseminate their activities. So that community now is visible. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think it's really great example how the university can serve to the society and this is a good example of realization of thought mission of university after educational research to social mission. Thank you very much. And also, I'm sorry, it's for you. <laughs> Thank you very much. And Weber, it's for you. <laughs> I'm sorry.